The Arkham franchise is a series of Batman video games, mostly created by Rocksteady, starting in 2009 and ending in 2015. With a total of three mainline games and a divisive prequel story, two spin-offs, three mobile games, and plenty of DLC. I'm a massive fan of the Arkham games, with it being responsible for my ever-growing love of Batman and getting me more into the character ever since I first played Asylum back in 2010. Fun fact, I got my parents to buy the game the same day that the Fred movie premiered, which I was excited for. I was one of those kids. And ever since I started reviewing media on this channel back in late 2019, I've been wanting to tackle a complete retrospective of the series and even start an attempt shortly after the pandemic hit and schools were taking six weeks off. I ended up getting distracted with other videos along the way, but about a year ago I finally came back to this and it's been my hyperfixation ever since. So today I'll be covering the main four games, Asylum, City, Origins, and Night, as well as the spin-offs Origins Blackgate and Arkham VR. I would also be covering the three mobile games, Arkham City Lockdown, Origins Mobile, and Arkham Underworld, because this is my channel, and when I say every, I mean every. But unfortunately, WB has made it literally impossible to play any of these games. And trust me, I tried. I tried using my phone, I tried using my old phone, I even tried Bluestacks, but the best I could get was an APK downloaded that would crash on startup due to low memory. So thanks to Warner Brothers, this video will always be incomplete to me, but anyways, one more thing that I guess I need to say, this video will be spoiling every game I talk about, and the Nomad ending of Cyberpunk 2077. I wouldn't think I need to make the first part of that disclaimer for an almost four hour video about it, but apparently it needs to be said. Also, I'm not gonna be talking about any DLC that's basically just a combat map because honestly, what is there to say? You do Arkham combat on a pretty cool looking map. Wow, should I really say that? 16 times. Anyways, I think that's about it for an intro. Let's waste no more time and get right into this retrospective. Arkham Asylum was released on August 25th, 2009, and was Rocksteady's second game ever released, which is pretty crazy to think about given how Asylum revolutionized Batman games along with gaming in general, with the signature combat style being adapted in other video games outside of the character. And especially given the fact that the game they made previously, Urban Chaos Riot Response, was a first-person shooter. Unfortunately, I don't own an original Xbox or PS2, let alone a copy of Urban Chaos, so I can't speak on how the game is, both the writing and gameplay aspect, but it's very strange in retrospect that the company that started with what looks to be your typical FPS was responsible for such a revolutionary franchise that started right afterward. So for the first entry into a series of Batman games, obviously the main story of the game is about Joker, with what was just a simple thwarting and bringing him to Arkham Asylum, quickly going south when he escapes and takes over the island. With a collection of villains from Batman's rogues gallery, now loose and eager for payback, you must stop them along your way of figuring out Joker's plan and putting an end to it. For your first Batman game, I I honestly can't think of a better place to start than Arkham Asylum. I mean, yeah, you could go for Gotham, but that's just blowing your load too early. Gotham's a massive city that houses the majority of Batman's rogues gallery that it could become very overwhelming and lackluster if you were to start there. Keeping it at Arkham Asylum on this small little island gives you a bit of constraint and makes the developers have to carefully pick which villains they'd like to use. And for a first run lineup, this isn't bad at all. Of course, you have the Joker, starring as the main villain, that's an obvious decision. You also get Harley Quinn, which is another no-brainer, especially when having the Joker. You get your classic well-known villains like Poison Ivy, Bane, the Riddler, and Killer Croc, an underused character like the Scarecrow, and someone more unknown like Zaz. You also get to play around and throw hints towards other villains like Two-Face, Calendar Man, Mr. Freeze, Clayface, and even Red Hood. Oh, I'm sorry, he's not Red Hood in this universe but we'll get to that when we get to it. Arkham Asylum pioneered its own style of combat gameplay that makes you feel like you're actually Batman. Or at least that's what everyone else says and I've just kind of blindly agreed with it even though I've never really had that sensation. I mean, don't get me wrong, it feels satisfying as fuck to beat the shit out of poor people, but I've never really gotten that feeling like you're Batman like everyone else seems to have. If anything, it's when Insomniac adapted that style of gameplay for Spider-Man is when I actually felt it. And for our first game, it's pretty good. Obviously, it's gotten better with each installment, but going back to here, it doesn't feel jarring. It's at its worst with the gliding, but that's only because you can't continuously glide in air from point A to point B as you can in all the other games. But again, 
it's understandable. You also have very minimal gadgets compared to the other games, which once again is understandable. You're only given the Batarang, Remote Control Batarang, Sonic Batarang, which is my crutch for every Predator mission in all four of these games, Multi Batarang, which I never use, Explosive Gel, Line Launcher, Cryptographic Sequencer, and finally the Bat Claw, which later upgrades to the Ultra Bat Claw, allowing you to grapple three things at once and tear down walls that you normally have to explode with the gel. The progression of getting the gear is done pretty well with stuff like the Explosive Gel, Bat Claw, Ultra Backlaw and Line Launcher being story driven and the rest being upgrades that you get while leveling up. Arkham Asylum's main story consists of the Joker giving himself up to be placed in the Asylum, which leaves Batman a little wary because it was too easy. To which he's correct in being cautious because almost immediately Joker breaks himself free to run rampant on the island, leading Batman on a wild goose chase as he works towards getting a hold of Dr. Young's formula for Titan, which he plans on injecting Gordon with in the end. It's basic. But it works for a first game, and the way it's able to link in most of the unrelated villains is pretty good being used as Roblox for Batman as the Joker progresses through his plans. There's a total of 11 boss fights in the game, and for the most part, they're not great. I doubt you'd even consider Zaz as a boss fight both times you go against him, with the first one just being a tutorial for grappling, and the second one you just knock him out with a battering. Regardless, this game is responsible for my love of Zaz, because he wasn't in the Lego game? Hmm, I wonder why. So this was my introduction to the character, and there was something about a man who carves a tally scar into his skin for every murder he commits and intrigued eight-year-old me. How was I allowed to play this game? Bane's boss fight is not good either. It's painfully simple with you just having to wait until he charges at you, throw a batarang to make him dizzy, climb on his back and pull out a plug. Do this multiple times depending on the difficulty and then you're done. The game tries to make it more difficult by throwing in goons, but for me, I didn't even have to hit a single one of them. As long as I just kept running so they couldn't get a hit on me and put all my focus on Bane, I was able to finish the fight in less than two minutes. I'll always remember though hearing Bane say Bruja and pausing the game to go look up what that meant, just to unpause and hear Batman tell Gordon what it meant. <laughs> it's Spanish for witch. Can you even consider Harley Quinn's fight to be hers? You spend the whole thing fighting against goons with her occasionally activating one of the three electric floors in the same exact pattern, and then when you finally get to fight her herself, it's just a cutscene where Batman throws her into a cell and that's it. I mean, the electric floors are interesting, but it's pretty disappointing not being able to actually go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Harley. Killer Croc's fight is terrifying and riddles me with anxiety every time. You have to go through his lair, trying to find spores for the Titan Antidote while moving slowly on these wooden boards, and occasionally Croc just jumps out of nowhere, making you have to figure out in what direction he's coming from and throwing a battering to knock him back down. And sometimes, Croc will just start breaking the boards, causing you to have to go into a full sprint for a short amount of time. I remember on one playthrough not knowing that you could get away with just crouching or holding a battering for slow movement and actually moving as slowly as I possibly could, just barely pushing the left stick forward, making this mission last forever. <laughs> Once you obtain all the spore samples and you're on your way back, Croc starts chasing you all the way back to the entrance, letting you eventually blow up the floor beneath him. It's a level that always leaves me on the edge of my seat in panic, just desperately trying to get through it. It's not a challenging fight, but instills enough fear in me that I never look forward to doing this in the best way possible. Poison Ivy's fight is... alright. Avoid getting hit, run away from the areas where the ground tries to grab you, and throw a batarang whenever the center flower opens. The fight even has a second stage, adding in mind-controlled guards that you have to knock out. It's pretty simple and fits with the theme of Poison Ivy, feeling like a natural fight that would happen. It's also a little bit reminiscent of her fight in LEGO Batman, but done far better. I've neglected to mention three fights that are kind of their own trilogy inside of the game, and that's because they are without a doubt the best that this game has to offer. Those being... The Scarecrow Encounters. I remember the first time I played the game, one of these encounters left me with so much stress, anxiety, and fear that I don't know how, but by the end of completing it, I was standing behind the couch shaking with my heart beating immensely. You gotta understand, back then, this was the hardest thing in the game for me. I go back now and it's incredibly simple as long as you have patience, which is probably why it was so difficult for eight-year-old me. <laughs> These are fucking amazing. With every time you're transported into these terrifying nightmares, they're different than the last in their own unique and great way. The first time having you trip out, seeing cockroaches swarm the walls, and Gordon getting dragged away, soon finding him dead. 
Batman trying to call Barbara to give her the bad news just to be left at voicemail and ending with you in the empty war room with whispers echoing through your head. Leaving the room brings you right back in, but with three bodies on the tables. Opening each one up reveals Thomas Wayne blaming Bruce for their death, Martha crying for help, and the final one... I remember this scaring me. I wish I could remember more, and I wish I could forget so I could do it again. The second time is when you're leaving the library, the hall's never ending, the room starts raining, and then you hear a conversation between Thomas and Martha that eventually leads to the infamous death of the Waynes. Now, I could complain about how this is experiencing the death of the Waynes for the umpteenth millionth time, but actually, I won't. Because this is one of the rare times where I think it's done incredibly well. You don't actually see the death happen, just hear it. And then shortly after, you flash from Batman to child Bruce, and there lies the corpses of Thomas and Martha, as the room by now has taken the shape of Crime Alley. Kneeling in front of them causes the Bat logo to shine on top of Bruce, and you get to hear a conversation between a cop that just shrugs off the murder as, it's fine, he's rich. And Commissioner Gordon, who actually has a heart and knows that even though he's rich, he's still a boy who just watched his fucking parents die, and tries to comfort Bruce as best as he can. But with the fact that this takes place during the Scarecrow's fear toxin setting in once again, the death of the Waynes makes sense because fundamentally this is the one thing that has put Bruce through the most amount of fear in his life. This event haunts him day by day, so having the toxin reenact this moment of fear works, at least in my opinion. The third time around puts the fear on the player in a much worse way than just a simple jump scare. <coughs> Sadly, I don't remember this happening, and my earliest memory of seeing it is through Jakey's horror in video games, but regardless, the game glitching out and restarting from the very beginning, but with all the roles swapped, and ending with a gunshot to the head and the game telling you to use the non-existent middle stick is fucking amazing. Why isn't it possible? It's just not. Why not, you stupid bastard? All three of these events lead you into the Scarecrow levels, where you have to do platforming while avoiding being seen as you make your way to a bat signal. On the third level, you have to fight through three waves of skeletons, which each wave lighting a bat signal and ultimately defeating Scarecrow. Well, at least defeating him in the nightmare world, you still have to follow him into the sewers where Croc ends up being the one to defeat him. Put a fucking pin in that and you've played through the series, you know why. The final fight you have is the Joker. But before I get into that, if you're able to do basic addition, you notice that I've only talked about 6 out of the 11 bosses. If you haven't played this game before, what rock are you living under? Why are you watching this video and can I please be you so I can experience this game for the first time again? But all the other fights are Titan bosses. Which are the second worst thing in this game. You have one after catching up to the Joker for the first time, where all you have to do is just avoid him and he eventually has a heart attack. Then you get to fight two after finding Joker's collection of Titan, which you basically do the same thing you did for Bane, but twice. And admittedly, it is fun to ride on the back of one and make them slap the shit out of the other. <laughs> then you get to fight another one in the sewers amongst, like, fucking 30 goons. And then you fight two of them before the Joker boss fight. And then the Joker boss fight is just a fucking glorified titan fight. Man, this game loves its titans. On easy mode, these are an annoyance at best, but when I originally tried to make this video back in 2020, I played the game on hard mode, and the amount of pain and anger I felt during every single fucking titan fight made me absolutely despise them. And notice that I said that the titans are the second worst thing in the game. The third worst are those fucking lunatics, mostly because they're a goddamn nuisance. But the worst thing in this game is the Joker fight. Why? That's the only thing that I can say is just why. Why would you put a boss fight against the Joker? A character so mad and complex. A character with hundreds of tricks up his sleeve. A character that balances out with Batman and creates such a dichotomy that you could do anything for a fight between the two. And you make it a glorified Titan fight. What in God's name made you think, ah, oh, yeah, we'll just have Joker infect himself with fucking Titan, and you just, you just fight that. 
And you don't even fight him in a great way. You just run around in a circle until he jumps back up onto his ledge, waiting until he turns around to suck up the fame from Jack Ryder in such an egotistical way that it barely even resembles the Joker, so then you could pull him to the ground, making his overly long nails get stuck into the wooden boards, beat him a bit, and do that three times until the game's over. I don't think I will ever understand this decision, and it doesn't ruin the game, but it ends it on such a very unsatisfying note. You were right there. You had something great going, and then you tripped. And you tripped hard. The post credit scene is cool though. Understandably, for a first game, Arkham Asylum only has two side quests, the Riddler and the story of Armadeus Arkham. And they're both basically the same thing. The Riddler involves you finding Riddler trophies, scanning riddles, and throwing a batarang at every chatterbox for some reason, that are scattered throughout the island while hearing Edward gloat about how much smarter he is and then cry whenever you solve a puzzle. Once you've found every trophy, riddle, and chatterbox, his quest line ends with you hearing the sounds of the police busting his location. You can also find maps lying around that will show a rough location of where a riddle or a trophy will be, which is pretty helpful. But I, I, I don't really get why the chatterboxes are involved. That seems more like a Joker thing. Why is it with the Riddler? Asylum's Riddler is fine, probably the second in the ranking of Riddlers in this franchise. Has the least amount of trophies, easy to finish, funny ending, and I honestly kinda like the maps, but that's about it. Don't really have much else to say. The story of Armadeus Arkham is somewhat the same thing. You're basically just looking for these headstone looking things that have a weird spider symbol on them and scanning each one of them. Once you've found 23 of them, you have to go all the way back to where you last left Quincy Sharp, the owner of Arkham Asylum and where Clayface is held, and scan the floor for the last story. I'ma be real, I've never given a fuck about any of these and I've never listened to a single one of them. <laughs> this game is also my introduction to Kevin Conroy, Mark Hamill, and Arlene Sorkin. The series in general is what got me more into Batman and brought me into the world of Gotham more than the Lego game ever could, but it was also the introduction of these three iconic performances. I wasn't alive for the animated series, never heard about it until way later in my teens, and I'm just now watching through it, so I had zero connection to that show. It was Arkham Asylum where I learned from my dad that Luke Skywalker was voicing the Joker in the game, and after a couple years went by, I learned about the animated series and Kevin Conroy. And then even later, I learned the story of Harley Quinn's creation, how it was based on a soap opera performance from Arlene Sorkin, making her literally Harley Quinn. I don't think there are words in the English language to describe how fucking amazing I think it is that a game that came out almost two decades after the original show was able to introduce those iconic roles to an eight-year-old who had never even heard of it. One thing I want to give massive props to is the vibe of this game. It's so fucking good. It's more on the horror-esque side of Batman, and it's done so exceptionally well. From the mossy undergrounds to the dingy sewers that Croc lives in, the broken buildings piled up in rubble that are scattered around the island, a whole-ass graveyard, even standing out in the opening, basking under the glow of the moon shining across the gritty, damp roads of the island. The moon is green! I don't know why, I thought that made a really good point. <laughs> also, speaking of the moon, why moon's so big? It, it, it's giving me Hermitcraft Season 8 vibes, and I don't like it, I'm scared. For real though, this game's horror vibes are off the fucking charts, and I love it. It's also just really beautiful. Like, I know that I'm playing the remaster, but even when I first attempted this video and played the original game on PC, this scene of Batman taking flight for the first time in the whole game was still fucking gorgeous. Another moment that I love from this game is towards the beginning where you first catch Joker and he's supposed to strike him down, end it right here, and Batman immediately pulls out a battering and contemplates for a few moments breaking his one rule before putting it away. I love it. Overall, Arkham Asylum is without a doubt a pioneer of many things and pushed forward what not only Batman, but superhero games are capable of, and it holds a special place in my heart for the impact it made on my love for the character. But unfortunately, due to my original 360 disc getting scratched after only one playthrough, that's where it ends for the nostalgia. Any other time I've played this game is after the pretext of City Origins and even Night. So while I still think it's a great game and has held up very well and I genuinely like it, it's never really got to give me a long-lasting impression outside of being the first in the series. Oh boy, yeah. 
Fun fact, if you go to Quincy's office and place explosive gel specifically on these three spots, you can blow up the wall leading you to a secret room showcasing plans for a new kind of jail. Arkham City. What an exciting secret! I sure wonder if it means anything. <laughs> Arkham City was released on October 18th, 2011. I vaguely remember playing it as a kid. I didn't own it, but my friend did, so he brought it over, and I remember watching him do the Ra's al Ghul fight. I might have played it as well, but I honestly can't remember. I mean, either way, I ended up getting a hold of its copy of both City and Night when I bought his Xbox One. <laughs> but holy shit, I'll go ahead and spoil it. This game is the best in the series. I agree with everyone else. No hot takes yet, but trust me, there will be. Instead of focusing on one story, we have three of them. Hugo Strange is planning to enact Protocol 10 on Arkham City, a walled-off section of Gotham that houses all the criminals, which turns out to be euthanasia. Oh yeah, and he also kidnapped Bruce Wayne and starts the damn game by saying this. By the end of tonight, I will be a hero, just like you. Batman. Meanwhile, Joker's in Arkham City, and turns out he's dying from the Titan formula that he injected himself with in the last game, and in classic Joker move, he injects both Batman and Gotham with his infected blood. Oh, and turns out Catwoman's in Arkham City, because I guess she lives here and she has beef with Two-Face and decides to rob Hugo Strange. So obviously, the main story of the game is about the Joker. Yeah, the game starts off as Strange and his Protocol 10 plans, but after knocking out Penguin, copying the Batsu from Alfred, and saving Catwoman from becoming Wish.com Harley Quinn due to Two-Face, the story quickly turns focus towards the Joker, with him revealing that he's been dying from the Titan formula, that he's been sending out his infected blood to hospitals in Gotham, and that he just injected it into Batman after getting knocked out by Harley. The only person in Arkham City that's capable of making a cure is Mr. Freeze, but uh-oh, the Penguin has a hold of him in such a sadistic fucking way, so you gotta go free him, the cops that Penguin's held captive, take care of Penguin and get Freeze's gun back, which results in a boss fight with Solomon Grundy. Okay, I can see that without any context, that makes no sense. <laughs> Yeah, so anyways, you fight Solomon Grundy because he was somehow underneath the Iceberg Lounge and Penguin was able to get his heart up and running. After defeating him, Freeze tells you that the cure requires an enzyme that needs to be bonded with human DNA, which just so happens to be Ra's al Ghul's blood, and there just so happens to be one of Talia's guards in one of the cases who breaks out and now you have to follow her blood trail. Doing so leads you on top of a roof where you find out Tim Drake is the Robin in this universe, and I feel like this game is responsible for me finding Tim to be the most boring and uninteresting Robin. I mean, come on, he's bald. My eyes! Anyways, placing a tracker on the Talia guard before she leaves ends up with you in the rundown Wonder City, beating up more women and finding Talia, who lets you take the demon trial, thinking that Batman is fine with killing and wants to join the League of Shadows, but instead, it takes you right to Ra's al Ghul, where you have a boss fight, he tries to sacrifice his own daughter, you get his blood, and then it's off to Freeze's base, where he refuses to give you the antidote until you get Nora back from Joker, and then he tries to kill you when you attempt to get the other bottle. Freeze's motives for completely turning against Batman and attempting to murder him has never really made much sense to me. Like, how is he supposed to get Nora and bring him back in time when he's just about to die? I mean, yeah, you get to survive a little longer because of the demon trial, but Freeze doesn't know that. All he knows is that you're poisoned, about to die, and the cure is finished. It would have been easier to just give him the cure and let him go get Nora afterwards, which is what you end up doing anyways. I mean, I get that it's a negotiation, but if you think about it, if the poison killed Batman while he was attempting to find Nora, Freeze gets no Nora. And he especially gets no Nora when you turn him into a human popsicle that dies from hypothermia or a broken body. Seems a bit foolish if you ask me, but also there's this Reddit post that makes Freeze's entire character and motive in the game make sense, so... Anyways, you defeat Freeze to find out that while you two were busy fighting, Harley managed to break into the safe and steal the only bit of the antidote that exists. Heading back to the steel mill, you get to meet up with Joker face to face, fight a little bit, he oddly doesn't have any bones for some reason, and then Strange enacts Protocol 10, causing Batman to end up under rubble, and the only reason why Joker doesn't kill him is because Talia steps in, sacrificing herself with a promise to Joker for internal life, as well as to be used as a tracker for Batman. All while this is happening, you occasionally get to control Catwoman during her own story. At the very beginning of the game, where you knock out a couple Two-Face goons, break into a safe, and then get held at gunpoint by Two-Face. Right after Batman's knocked out by Harley, where you find out the Catwoman's plan is to rob Hugo Strange, and it's off to find Poison Ivy for some help, which results in fighting a couple mind-controlled officers and goons, and then getting captured. And then once more, right after Batman is left under a pile of rubble, where you get to finally break into Strange's vault, knock out some guards, steal the loot, and walk straight out of Arkham City, 
ending the game. No, that was not an editing trick on my behalf. That is actually what the game does if you decide to leave Batman under the rubble and take off with the loot. It's really fucking cool and begs the question on why in the goddamn hell all the Catwoman shit was taken out and repackaged as a DLC. Which meant I never got to play any of this until the remasters came out and rightfully put the Catwoman sections back into the base game. But yeah, what you're supposed to do is sacrifice the loot to go save Batman, which explains how Catwoman just happens to show up and save the day. Afterwards, Batman argues with Barbara and Alfred because Bruce wants to be selfish and go save Talia, while Barbara and Alfred want Batman to save Gotham. I honestly think this interaction between the three is really great, along with the earlier interactions with Barbara where she has to reset Bruce's attention and put it back on what's important. Heading up Wonder Tower and taking a break to get the Gotham-based jumper achievement, you take down Strange and put a stop to Protocol 10 just for it to then be revealed that the true leader of this whole situation was actually Rachel Ghoul. The twist makes sense, I guess. Rachel Ghoul is looking for a predecessor and clearly wants it to be Batman, but he gives Strange a chance at it as long as he defeats Batman, to which he failed doing, hence why he steps in and takes over for merely five minutes before Strange activates the self-destruction, causing Batman and Rach to jump out a window and Rach committing seppuku. I will stop you. <laughs> I doubt it. Five minutes later. Like I said, it makes sense, but at the same time, I don't know. It just kind of comes off as a twist villain for the sake of a twist villain. Doesn't ruin the game or anything, but it does make the Doctor Strange plotline end on a less than satisfying note. And given how this is the least interesting part of the game, the ending doesn't do it much favors. If you come back to where Rachel landed, his body isn't there anymore, which is pretty cool. And that moment is even referenced in the Season of Infamy DLC for Arkham Knight. With Rage supposedly dead, Strange actually dead, and the top of Wonder Tower being a ball of flames, it's time to finally go back to Joker and save Talia, as well as get the cure. Get your cute little ass in a movie theater! Okay, I now get why they say he's gay. Talia is able to use her ninja skills to kill the Joker, giving Batman the cure and saving the day. <laughs> oh. Yeah, so it turns out Joke has been using Clayface to keep up the appearance of being fine as he slowly dies in the background waiting for the cure. Now, this is a twist that I like, because this entirely makes sense to me. Of course Joker would get Clayface to pretend to be a healthier him, and Clayface playing the role makes perfect sense. I mean, it's Clayface. Who the hell else are you going to get to play a very convincing Joker that sounds exactly like Mark Hamill? And Honestly, he does a really great job. I totally understand why Carlo was famous during his prime. But also... Unlike the Rache twist, this game gives you little hints towards the reveal as you progress through the story, even up until the reveal. You get Harley having this line of dialogue after infiltrating the steel mill for the first time. Oh, Mr. Jay, it's a miracle. You look perfect. Oh no, it's not you, is it? Be quiet, Harley. <laughs> 
when Drew trails for the fake Joker gag and gets knocked out, you can very well notice that the other Joker that tackles him is a lot better looking than the one lying in the chair. Same goes for right before the Joker fight where you see in the mirror a dying Joker and then he turns around and looks fine. And even at the very end, the movie that's playing in the theater is The Terror, which happens to star Carlo in the leading role. But the best hint at this reveal is during the Joker fight, as well as right outside of the theater. If you go into Detective Vision and look at the Joker, he has no bones. Everyone has bones. Sick Joker has bones. Clayface do not have bones. Healthy Joker do not have bones. It's a really cool hint that I never knew about until way later after already playing the game. You have a fight with Clayface that ends with him being sucked into the Lazarus Pit and the Joker stabbing Batman in the arm at an attempt of getting the cure, but ends up with the cure on the floor and Joker on his knees desperately trying to get any bit that he can. And during his final moments, Batman tells a joke. Do you want to know something funny? Even after everything you've done, I would have saved you. <laughs> that actually is pretty funny. <laughs> and with that final breath is the end of Arkham City's story. Killing off one of the most iconic characters of all time, and in such a damn good way as well. I love how that's how it ends. Joker dies from his own selfishness, and the last thing he hears as he has his last laugh and sucks in that final breath is that he was right. That Batman would have still given him the cure regardless of everything he's put him through tonight, and everything he's ever done. It's such a beautiful way to end a character, especially one so iconic, and is without a doubt one of the best deaths of the Clown Prince of Crime, though it's definitely a toss-up between this and Batman Beyond Return of the Joker. I also love how Batman comes out of the theater carrying the Joker's body the same way it's shown in the painting you see at the beginning of the game. That is, if the Catwoman DLC is installed. The boss fights are an improvement from the last game, but are still lacking. You have Mr. Hammer, Mr. Sickle, and a Titan henchman that Penguin somehow has that are basically Titan bosses, but they're handled differently. Asylum, you have to wait for them to do a charge, shoot a Batarang, jump out the way, and then beat them down, then doing this various times. City, you just stun them three times and beat the shit out of them. Do this maybe twice. I'll take City's Titans over Asylum's any day of the week, but at the end of the day, they're both Titan fights and it sucks. The fight with he who has no bones has Mr. Hammer returning, but it's basically the same thing. Things start getting good with Solomon Grundy, which is kind of a titan, but the gameplay is vastly different that it's far more entertaining than any fight in Arkham Asylum. It introduces a new style of boss fight for the series, with the story interjecting between the fight and switching up the gameplay, something that I don't think ever happened in the last game. Oh, and you can knock out Penguin again in the greatest way possible. The fight against Clayface is pretty good, with a combination of dodging his attacks, throwing freeze grenades into him, and trying to get him to roll into the bombs that, for some reason, are here, but I just assume that's Joker's doing. You also get to play as Batman with a sword, which is really fun. It makes sense for Ray Ogle's fight to be so memorable for me, because holy shit, the vibe of the Demon Trial is amazing. The fight against Raish is so grand compared to anything else in both Asylum and City, with you having a trade-off between fighting a bunch of sand people and Raish being disguised as one of them, to dodging floor blades while shooting an electrical charge at a giant Ray Ogle surrounded by sand statues of himself as he throws shurikens and occasionally drops his sword on you, ending with Raish flying down from the sky for you to counter a sword strikes against him, and then you transport it back into the real world for a moment, and then back into the Lazarus world. It's on this level of fantasy that the series hasn't seen yet, but feels so perfect for Batman. It's a really good fight, and like I said, no wonder it's so memorable. And then of course, there's the Mr. Freeze fight, which unanimously has been deemed as the best boss in the entire Arkham series, and unfortunately my hot takes do not start here, because I 100% completely agree, this fight is fucking amazing. You're trapped in one room, no access to the gargoyles, which is a massive crutch for me personally, because I rely on them so heavily with Freeze hell-bent on killing you and saying the most terrifying shit.
Oh yeah, he can also see your footprints, which means he walks the exact same path you do throughout the entire fight, which you can use to your advantage and put him in a certain situation if you're good enough at it. But at the same time, that is fucking terrifying. Like, I know it's all AI and none of it's real, but reading on the wiki, Freeze will be able to see your footprints? Puts me into a paralyzing state of fear. That is actually shit the bed terrifying. But of course, the reason why this is the best fight in the franchise is because Freeze learns from every move that you make, meaning you can't make the same one twice. The horrifying part about this is that there's only 12 different ways that you can harm Freeze, and on the hardest difficulty, you have to hurt him 9 times. I only had to do it 3 times because I play on easy mode, but trying to find 3 separate ways to hurt this man? I was struggling by the 3rd time, I cannot imagine having to find 9 of them. I will say, I like how at one point the game will give you a list of everything that you can do, which in the case of recording this video ended up happening towards the end of the fight, but I remember, it must have been like the first time I did this, rapidly running around trying to hide and having no idea what to do or how to attack him, and I don't know how long I went without hurting Freeze, but that help showed up real quick. <laughs> it's like the game knew, oh you have no idea what you're doing here. <laughs> But yeah, it's a great fight and easily the best in the whole franchise. There's some good ones in the future games that we will of course talk about, but not a single one is able to top this. In Arkham City, there are now 11 side missions, including the Riddler. There's 12 if you count the AR training, but I didn't bother doing it because I've dog shit at it, and the reward is like an in-game trophy and an achievement, so I don't find any worth in doing them. But just because there's more, doesn't mean they're good. In fact, a lot of them kind of suck. Remote Hideaway, Hot and Cold, and Heart of Ice are completely pointless to have be their own standalone mission, given how they're all basically just go to a building and retrieve a thing. Remote Hideaway is literally go to the back door of the Iceberg Lounge, get a mine detonator, and leave. Hot and Cold is to go to a subsection of the steel mill and grab the freeze cluster grenade. There's one thing from this that I like, and that's Harley Quinn tied up. That sounds a lot worse when I say it out loud. This <laughs> is kind of a random thing. Like, I don't know who tied her up. I don't know who unties her, so then she's there at the end of the game. It just kind of happens, and you end up completely walking past her and having no idea. And it's just funny to stand there and keep taking the duct tape on and off. And Heart of Ice is to go find Norrin. whoop de fucking do It's the building in the steel mill close to the GCPD. Like, I get it. They're not enough to force the player to do in the story, but giving them their own titles and dedicated missions is a little too much. And besides, the only one I find useful is Remote Hideaway because you're gonna need that Mind Detonator for some of the Riddler trophies. Acts of Violence makes more sense to be its own standalone thing, but that doesn't mean it's great. As you fly around Arkham City, occasionally you'll hear a goon threatening a political prisoner, so you find where that's at, take the goon down in like one hit, and that's it. The cycle happens 16 times and then you're done. The best part about the whole thing is when I accidentally shot a remote electrical charge at a political prisoner and he thanked me. Thanks. Other than that, nothing special. The tea party is when we start getting actual stories or events with the rogues gallery, and it's the first appearance of Mad Hatter, who will later go on to appear in Origins in the DLC for Night. Rocksteady did want to have Hatter in Asylum though, supposedly controlling a children's hedge mage, but they got scrapped. The tea party starts in such a weird way, where it does work in the context of the story. Mad Hatter shows up after you save Vicky Vale, and then you just get a notification on your map with Alfred saying that there was a cure and he left it there. This has always struck really odd to me, because I really don't see any way in hell that Batman would believe that in the slightest. He only told Robin to analyze his blood and search the hospitals. Nothing about a cure. Barbara knew that Rachel Gould's blood was the only way to make a cure. I'm sure Alfred would have been told that by now. It also makes even less sense that you can do it after the story is finished and Batman's already cured. Having no need for one, and especially at that point, would obviously know it's a trap. I guess you could make the argument for both that it's just Batman going there to see what's up, but... Dear lord, does that make Mad Hatter the biggest fucking idiot. Also, if Mad Hatter is responsible for Alfred saying that there's a cure, he either A, somehow was able to leave Arkham City, make it to the Wayne Mansion and the Batcave, which means that he knows that Bruce is Batman, brainwash Alfred into leaving a message through whatever means that makes it so Batman hears it while looking at the map, and get back in time for Batman to maybe go check it out immediately in the span of one minute. Or B, this means that the Arkhamverse is just a look into the future, because Jervis Tech had 2023 AI in 2011. The level's kinda shit if I'm being honest. It's basically just a Mad Hatter themed combat map that you fight in for a bit until eventually you knock out Mad Hatter. And then that's it. Aside from a cool cutscene right before, it's 
nothing special. Afterwards, you can get a riddle and an interaction between Hatter and Catwoman. So I guess that's nice, but the actual Hatter fight sucks in my opinion. Fragile Alliance features Bane being in Arkham City and looking for Titan crates that somehow made it from the asylum and tasking Batman to go search for half while he looks for the other. Either Batman agrees and you start the search, or you're doing this at the end of the story and you've already destroyed three of them already, so Batman gets to be big brain. Returning reveals that Bane set you up, collected his half for himself, and plans to kill Batman. Before that, though, a bunch of goons just randomly show up and you get to fight them with Bane. It makes no sense at all, but I love it, because fighting alongside Bane is so goddamn great. I wish I could do it more often. Anyways, you get to fight Bane, except no, not really. It's just a cutscene where Batman locks him up, and what you get to do is blow up the rest of the containers. Yay. Shot in the Dark is where things start to get better, with randomly running into a political prisoner on the roof, results in said prisoner being shot right in front of you, and in no time, Batman figures out that it was from Deadshot. I liked it when he said, You see a prisoner? It seems unlikely, but I'm not ruling anything out. When he literally met him at the very beginning of the game in a prison outfit. I mean, I guess, to be fair, Deadshot was in there being hired by Strange, so makes sense. And hey, he was right about Bruce Wayne being on his list. But anyways, three political prisoners die, and you eventually track it back to Deadshot and find out that he's set on killing Jack Ryder, Bruce Wayne, and finally, Batman. You quickly save Jack Ryder, and it's the start of the boss fight between the world's greatest detective versus the world's deadliest assassin. And you literally just wait until his back is turned, crawl into a grate, and enact a takedown. That's it. So, like... It starts off promising and then just immediately falls flat the moment you get to the boss fight, which is the most important part. You can say the same for Cold Call Killer because you occasionally rush to find a phone, listen to a phone call, do this a couple times until you find where Zaz is and then knock him out. And you'd be valid to an extent because at least getting through Zaz's hideout is more complicated than getting to Deadshot. But also at the same time, I just like listening to Danny Jacobs' Zaz, and it was this quest that made me really love his performance, specifically the way he delivers this line. Card by card, my heart sank. A three, a four, a five, a six, a damn seven! It's a pretty good side mission, and Zaz is used far better here than he was in Asylum, but at the same time, I can't help but feel like he was still slightly underused, and I wish he would have had return for something else in the future. Identity Theft is the best side mission in the whole game, with random dead bodies appearing with their faces surgically taken off, and all signs pointing towards Bruce Wayne as the killer. Obviously, this doesn't make any sense, and you gotta figure out who did this, but at one point, Oracle asks if Bruce is sure that it's not him, to which Kevin delivers my second favorite performance from him of all time. What did you say? He sounds like when a parent yells at you and then you say something under your breath. I love it so much. If you know anything about the Batman lore, then you know that the actual murderer is Thomas Elliot, aka Hush, and his reasoning, at least in this game, is to make himself look like Bruce Wayne so he can ruin his life as an act of revenge. It's horrifying, especially at the beginning of the game when you first go to the church to find the Joker, and you can actually see Thomas lying on a gurney holding tightly onto a cooler. The quest ends with Batman basically losing and Hush getting away, leaving this particular story on a cliffhanger that hopefully continue on in the next game and not be incredibly disappointing. And then there's Watcher in the Wings, where at the very beginning of the game, all the way back when you're first imprisoned, you can see a mysterious figure standing on the roof of a building looking down on you, and then he disappears. Later throughout the game, that mysterious figure will appear on top of various buildings depending on where you're at in the story, and going to him results in him saying some mysterious prophecy shit, and then marking a symbol, and disappearing. Building the whole symbol and aligning it in the right place reveals the location. Going to it sees the mysterious figure, called Azrael, coming down and spouting more prophecy shit, and then once again disappearing, and this time for good. I honestly don't think I will ever not be confused by this whole quest. Him being at the very beginning of the game is cool, though, because you have to actively look for where he's at. It's an easy thing to miss, and I love it when games do that. And, of course, Enigma Conundrum is basically the Riddler Trophies, Riddles, Tiger Cameras instead of Joker Teeth, which still doesn't make much sense why it's aligned with Riddler, and also the addition of Catwoman Trophies that are not important to the actual Riddler story. Which, yeah, Riddler is inside of Arkham City and has taken the Doctor from the Church hostage, and you gotta find all the trophies and riddles to eventually unlock every location that the Doctors are at save them, and then find where Riddler is hiding, and he's got everyone else from the church tied to machines that'll force them to constantly walk around a slot car track with bombs strapped to their head that'll go off if they stop walking. 
This is fucking horrifying. In fact, all of these rooms are horrifying. Like, goddamn, Riddler's just being jigsaw at this point. I honestly can't hate it. Oh, and then of course you get the satisfaction of pulling the Riddler down through the floorboards and knocking him out, which makes up for the fucking trophies. The game does change how to show where they're at with instead of finding a map that unlocks everything in a certain section, throughout the city are random goons highlighted in green that you must interrogate, and then you only get a couple of places marked. I honestly don't hate it. It's a nice way to balance out the absurd amount with the useful help. The only thing I don't like is when there's other goons nearby, so I gotta carefully target everyone else and take them all down while trying to avoid the highlighted one as best as I can and hope to god the game doesn't auto-lock Batman onto him. I kinda like how Origins just makes it so the guy can never be taken down. The actual placement of the trophies are about as usual as you would expect. Some places are clever, some are just randomly placed. This one specifically was a fucking nightmare because I couldn't for the life of me figure out how to do it, and the walkthrough I was looking at did it in the most complicated way possible. So yes, I did rage quit this trophy for a bit, and then found an easier way to tackle it. The riddles are whatever. They're nice little nods to things. Nothing all that special except for the Crime Alley one. That's just dark. And then there's the Catwoman trophies, which, like I said, provide no purpose to the Riddler story. I don't think you have to get any of the Catwoman trophies in order to progress through the Riddler story, given how, like we've previously established when this game first came out, the Catwoman shit was a DLC. Overall, the Riddler's alright in here. Not too challenging most of the time, terrifying story, and a satisfying ending. It's easy to say Arkham Asylum Riddler is the best because there's less trophies and it's easier. I would know, it's what I initially wrote in the script. But I'd say Cities is the best because the story provides a purpose to it. Yeah, it's a fuck ton of trophies, but they're not that hard to get. And the occasional banter between the goons makes the time go by even when it gets pretty repetitive. And the ending is pretty satisfying. Asylums is quick and easy with not much to get, and then you get to hear Riddler getting taken in by the police, which is funny but not as great as watching Batman rip him into the floorboards and give him a concussion. But speaking of Catwoman, might as well talk about her in this game. I already talked about three parts of her story, but there's a fourth one at the very end, after the events of the main story. Selina goes back home just for it to explode, so you head to the museum and all the way to the armory to take down Two-Face. This place is set up like it's a Predator mission, but in my first playthrough of this, I recall the goons just constantly respawning, and then at some point I just said fuck it and went straight for Two-Face and was able to finish it so quickly. So for this video, I just skipped any bit of taking down goons and went directly to Two-Face, almost died, but in the nick of time enacted the cutscene. I guess that I'm playing this on easy mode, so somebody doing this on even normal, let alone hard or new game plus is gonna struggle a lot more. But Jesus, even for an easy mode, this is way too easy. But I honestly don't see a point in going through the effort to get rid of the goons if there's just gonna be an endless supply of them, so might as well just attack head on and hope for the best. Afterwards, the only thing you can do as Catwoman is traverse through Arkham City looking for the rest of the jewels that Two-Face stole, collect the special Riddler trophies, and talk to other villains in the city that you're able to. What the hell are you supposed to be? Piss off! Really? Okay, if you insist. Oh, I forgot to say, speak to me like that again, Penguin, and I'll show you just what it feels like for a poor little bird to be torn apart by a cat. Please, don't hurt me! I didn't mean it! That's much nicer. See? You can be nice, Oswald. See you around. Well, isn't this nice? I guess Batman found your wife after all. Yes. My beautiful Nora is now safe. So, is now a good time to talk to you about an idea I had to steal the Pharaoh's diamond from the Egyptian Museum? It's really hot there, and, well, all this latex really makes a girl sweat. Leave me with my wife, Catwoman. Just asking, Freeze. Just asking. Get me out of here! It's that kind of attitude that gets you in these kind of situations. If you don't open this door, I'll kill you too. Will you really? <laughs> See you later, Bane. Hopefully next time, you'll know how to talk to a lady. Well, well. Julian Day. What are you doing here? Catwoman? How very nice to see you here. Don't get too excited. There's no way I'm letting you free. Not after that Falcone mess. How funny that you should mention that illustrious family. And so close to your birthday. Tell me, are you expecting anything specific from your father this year? What do you mean? Oh, nothing, really. 
I'll be seeing you, kitty cat. This year or next. Are you Alice? Sorry, Jervis. It's me, Catwoman. Oh, Alice. I need my Alice. Wow. Strange really did a number on you, didn't he? Listen, I'm going to go and find Alice, okay? I hear she's with the Cheshire Cat. Somewhere. Where have you been? Where is my... You haven't got it, have you? Yeah, about that. Look, Red, it wasn't my fault. Strange didn't... I'll kill him. Be my guest. I'll kill all of you. Okay, then. I think I'll be going now. Yes, go! Join the rest of the meat. I'll destroy them all. First Strange, then Gotham. No one will be safe. Ugh. No way am I going in there. Of all the people in Arkham City, Mr. Zaz gives me the creeps. Hey! Over here! Never learn, Eddie. I'm not interested in your silly little games. It's pretty cool and adds more to the universe, and the actual gameplay mechanics of Catwoman are very unique to her and work pretty well. You have your generic combat that's pretty much the same as playing as Batman, aside from a different set of tools that sometimes do similar things. Like, the whip is definitely just Catwoman's version of the grappling hook, but then you have her cattle troughs, which stuns the enemy when they walk over it, and the bolus, which stuns the enemy when thrown at them. Moving around Arkham City is a lot different than Batman, where you can just glide around and occasionally you have to just grapple a building, hit the grapnel boost, and go flying. Catwoman has to launch herself towards the building you're trying to climb. Then you press either jump or the same button you use for the whip as Selina jumps up the wall. It's a hell of a lot slower, and when I first played as Catwoman, I thought the controls were really clunky, but I eventually got the hang of it, and it's a bit fun to use. I would never go from the Bowery to the Industrial District using Catwoman, but at a short distance, it can feel pretty satisfying. This game is also responsible for Grey Delisle being my definitive voice for Catwoman. Her voice is perfect for Selena Kyle, and the way she delivers her lines in such a low-key, sultry, but heavily sarcastic style is just fucking top tier. And while other actresses have come close to sounding like her, I think Grey will forever be my Catwoman in the same way Kevin is my Batman and Mark is my Joker. This is also the debut of Tara Strong as Harley Quinn, which she rightfully took up the mantle after Arlene Sorkin retired, and is without any doubt the second best Harley right underneath Arlene. I do occasionally hear Tara Strong through Harley, and there's a couple times where I've heard Timmy Turner or Bubble slip in just a tiny bit, but for literally replacing Arlene, it is damn good. And Tara rightfully deserves the role and to basically be casted as Harley anytime in the future. If you need Harley, just get Tara. The rest of the voice cast is pretty good. Troy Baker as Two-Face and Tim Drake. Nolan North as the Penguin. Michael Goff is one of the Tiger Guards, which I knew the moment I walked into the Wonder Tower Predator mission and heard Skyrim characters speaking. That's the last one. Area secured. I will never be able to escape that game. Not saying that Corey Burton did a bad job at Strange, far from it. If anything, he should be the definitive voice in my head, given how this is the game that introduced me to Strange. But I'm sorry, after binging all of the Batman 2004 recently, I am only ever capable of thinking about Richard Green's performance whenever I see the character. Oh wait, no, I'm sorry, I'm just finding out that Richard Green's was just the replacement voice. And Frank Gorshin was the original? What the fuck? Also, thanks to Arkham City, it's hard for me to enjoy Ron Perlman's Clayface in the animated series because I'm so used to the voice in this game. The soundtrack in this game slaps even harder. The main theme alone is pure Batman, from the pumping percussion along with that creeping bass to the gospel choirs and those wailing strings. Really gets me in the mood to send goons to the hospital with 205 broken bones. The game's also a lot hornier than I remember it being. Mr. J is really not up to a visit right now. He's not feeling himself. Well, actually, he was earlier, but that's not what I meant. I get a ride on the heart. Woman sure is hot. Oh, I'd love me a piece of her. Joker had me drag Freeze's lady to a van. Did you see what she looked like? Is she hot? She's in a block of ice. If you thought her out, would she be hot? Yeah, she's kind of good-looking in a near-dead, frozen sort of way, I guess. 
Nice. What's wrong with you? There ain't nothing wrong with me. I've just been stuck in this place so long that if a half-attractive piece of skirt comes my way, I'm not bothered if she's a little cold. Know what I mean? No, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> that Catwoman is one hot piece. She can do whatever she wants to me. Won't see me complaining. Ivy may be hot, but she's dangerous too. Since when have you been all about reading, anyway? I read. Horn don't count. Catwoman should watch out. Walking around looking like that could get her in trouble. Right! Arkham City is great at everything. Being an Arkham game, being a Batman game, being a Batman story, even just being a video game. And not only that, but just as a story. I once heard the question, when did you realize that video games are art? And I never really had a personal answer to that because the core games I played during my childhood was Lego Batman and the Complete Saga, Rainbow Six New Vegas 2, Ben 10 Vilgax Attacks, Rascals, Kingdom and World of Keflings, Oblivion and Skyrim, Animal Jam, Minecraft, many games on Cool Math. By the time I was old enough to have an interest in gaming and being on that side of the internet, games like FNAF and Undertale came out while a lot of my friends were playing FPS games. Games. I was playing Minecraft in Portal 2 and sometimes FPS is if I felt like it, but not often. Red Dead 2 and The Last of Us Part 2 comes out as I'm leaving my teen, so by then I just instinctively know that video games can be art, never had the moment of realization. Until now. I've played Arkham City before making this video many times, but it wasn't until I was writing this part of the script and wondered if this game was considered one of the greatest games of all time and saw this. And I agree. Arkham City's story from a writing perspective starts with giving you its B-plot, later introducing its A-plot. The B-plot incites the big action scene in the third act, while the A-plot tells a long-told tale of Batman vs. the Joker, but this time telling the tale of the Joker's death, and as I've previously said, in one of the best ways possible. I don't really like the idea of video game adaptations, because video games require the emotion of playing it and experiencing it in that specific way, that it's hard to put that into the experience of just watching it. But you could take this story and make an absolute banger of an animated movie out of it. I love this game, it's one of my favorites. It gets 10 gold blooms out of a possible 10 gold blooms. That's my highest rating. Oh yeah, and if you go onto this boat and locate these cords on the sequencer, it'll open up a secret door where you can find the inside infested with roaches, scientific equipment, a dead body, and a note to Jonathan Crane. What an exciting secret! I wonder if it means- Along with the Catwoman sections, there was another piece of DLC for Arkham City, and that is Harley Quinn's Revenge. The DLC lets you play as Robin, except for the two sections where he plays Batman for about half an hour in total. The story takes place shortly after the events of the main story with Harley, who's in mourning and taken over the steel mill by now, kidnapping a bunch of cops in an attempt to get Batman to show up because she plans on killing him in revenge for killing the Joker. The DLC starts off with Robin showing up to the steel mill in search of Batman, who's been missing for two days. You go through the steel mill, beating up goons here and there, as well as finding where Harley's keeping a bunch of cops held hostage. You find Batman's belt, which causes a flashback, and the first section where you get to play as the Dark Knight again. Entering the steel mill through Harley and Joker's room, office, or whatever the hell this place is that's covered in failed pregnancy tests, you beat up a group of Harley's goons and save a cop who tells you that the rest of them were dragged away to somewhere else. Leaving the building, you immediately get to hear a goon asking about where the cops are held, almost spilling the location, so naturally put everyone in a coma and soon after find a cop's radio laying on the ground which lets you set up a quick crime scene, grab a spot of blood from the cop, and start the trail. Following said trail leads you to a security door and three goons, two to knock out, one to interrogate. He tells you that you need three key codes to get in and gives you the location before gaining a concussion. Too late. After getting each code and entering the building, you traverse through until eventually landing upon a room with a captured cop, a couple goons, and a few snipers. Typical Predator mission, but after taking down everyone and going to free the cop, a cutscene is enacted where Harley shoots Batman, a goon gets electrocuted by his belt, and we're brought back to present day with Robin. After beating up a couple goons in a corridor, you enter a room where Batman's been held captive, in a glorified hamster ball held by a giant statue of the Joker, and in order to free him, you need the key from Harley. After a couple rooms and a couple goons, you end up in a room with Harley and the captive cops that you found earlier, which enacts Harley's boss fight of the DLC. Which is basically just a Predator mission, but without inverted takedowns or even a sonic shuriken, so... Fuck me, I guess. <laughs> 
You take down enough goons until one of them holds one of the cops at gunpoint, in which you save him, and then I just went straight for Harley after that, which was a pretty easy fight. <laughs> you know what's not a pretty easy fight? The one you walk into right after defeating Harley. Here you get to fight 100,000 goons with shields and knives and stun batons and armor, because of course, gotta give them all the most annoying gear. Oh, and of course, a Titan boss. All at the same time. Now that doesn't sound all that bad, but despite having maxed out physical and bullet armor, it does not feel like it because it goes away almost immediately. Robin's combat feels like dog shit compared to Batman and only has half of the gadgets he has. And I also swear to God this DLC is on hard mode. Now maybe it's just me being terrible at video games like usual, but I've played this DLC like three times and every time I have to make multiple attempts at this specific fight because I keep fucking dying. I can never get a good combo going because I'll just immediately hit a shield or a dude with armor. My health plummets due to the Titan and batons. And above all that, it's just fucking annoying. I basically just have to spam the snap flashes to take down every non-geared up goon, which ends up being like half of them while trying to avoid the other half, then slowly whittle away everyone else, all while trying to avoid the Titan boss. I just do not like this part at all, and I don't think I ever will. Robin saves Batman, then Harley says that this place is about to blow up, so it's back to being Batman so you can defuse all the bombs. Returning to the Joker statue afterwards, you're met with Harley floating in the air because the statue did not load at all during this section. <laughs> Who's occasionally trying to shoot you while you fight a bunch of Wonder City robots, and this fight is the polar opposite of the last one. Where the former was annoying, the latter is boring. This one was just pressing X until eventually it was finished. I know I'm coming across as a can't be happy no matter what type, and you're right, but that's just how I feel. One gives you way too many enemies and crutches that it becomes annoying, and the other gives you no challenge at all to the point that it's boring. I don't know what else to say. Harley hits the invisible detonator switch. I wonder if she got that from Wonder Woman, but of course you're able to take her down and escape before dying in the explosion. Except Robin was still in there saving the police. So while Batman's staring at the burning building, no doubt blaming himself like he does for fucking everything, Harley takes the opportunity for a sneak attack, but oh, would you look at that, it's Robin Shuriken saving the day. He's alive, and Batman doesn't give two fucks anymore. <laughs> Overall, I will say, I'm not really a big fan of this DLC. I mean, yeah, getting to play more in this world, seeing how Harley's coping with the Joker's death, and controlling Robin are cool, but in the end, I just feel like the DLC isn't much. I mean, I don't get much joy through playing it. Robin's gameplay is just a worse Batman. You get the Shuriken, which is just as battering, Explosive Jail, which is the same for both characters, the Zip Kick, which lets you grapple the goons, and that's it, the Bullet Shield, a worse version of the Detonator, and the Snap Flash, which is Robin's only real unique gadget, and, and even then, I only used it when this game made me, and during that one fight. Oh, and I guess the remote control Shuriken and smoke bombs, but those are utterly useless in here. The story really isn't anything. You just defeat Harley with nothing else happening, and even then, her two boss fights aren't really fights, and if anything, are just carbon copies of her fights in Asylum. The only other positive I think I can give is that this is probably my favorite Harley Quinn design of all time. The red and black suit is iconic, and seeing those colors blended in with the morning aesthetic and then glossed with this Hot Topic shine just looks so good to me. Other than that, I guess the DLC is worth playing once just to experience it, but nothing after that. It's one of the DLC of all time. Two years after Arkham Asylum, Rocksteady was able to bring Arkham City, which did fucking wonders in terms of reception and money. So when Rocksteady wasn't mm -hmm. able to bring a third game by 2013, Warner Brothers got a bit impatient and hired out their own game studio in Montreal to make a side game for the series to hold over fans, as well as make more money while Rocksteady was busy working on the end of their trilogy. Oh, and the fun part about all of this is that nobody working on Arkham Knight was aware of Origins being made, which meant Kevin Conroy got in a bit of legal trouble. They didn't even tell us about Origins. I didn't even know about Origins. I was asked about it in a panel. Oh, are you, are you in the next Arkham game? And I said, has that been announced? <laughs> and they said, oh yeah, yeah, that's been announced. I said, well, yeah, I, I, I am in the next Arkham game. They said, oh, that's so cool, Arkham Origins. And I went, Arkham what? <laughs> and then they said, which game are you talking about? <laughs> and then 
and I got a call from Warner Brothers. <laughs> I'm not kidding. From a vice president at Warner Brothers. Saying, you are in serious breach of contract. And you have let something out of the bag, and you are forbidden to ever go to a Comic-Con again. What? I said, do you know how much I promote this character? Do you know how much free publicity I give you guys? So we reached a deal where, I'm not, I'm not kidding, for a while they would send a minder. <laughs> from Warner Brothers. I said, am I in kindergarten? <laughs> they would send a minder to watch me do panels like this. There'd be someone standing backstage. Yeah, it's like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> You know, as soon as it was, the question would go into some dangerous territory, you'd hear. <laughs> and this sad clip of Barbara's voice actress, Ashley Green, exists. This is not the first game that Barbara Gordon has been in. You've heard her voice in the past, but this is actually the first game where you get to see her. Oh, honey, how wrong you are. <laughs> I feel so bad. Arkham Origins is the red-headed, step-black sheep of the franchise, with a lot of the fan base turning it away solely because it wasn't made by Rocksteady or have Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill. There's also the fact that when the game launched, it was incredibly buggy on PC, and I think still is, or that it's a prequel story, or that there's a lot of similarities to the older games, or that Gotham feels incredibly dead, or there's shit in here that makes no sense canon-wise. If I'm being entirely honest, Arkham Origins feels like a bootleg, but it's hard to fully call it one because bootlegs don't really slap this fucking hard. First of all, this opening fox from the triumphant music syncing up with Bruce's walking to the epic shot of Batman gliding into Blackgate, this opening gets me so hyped up and excited to play through the story once again. Arkham Origins is a prequel story taking place before Asylum, but more specifically in Year 2, where Batman meets many different members of his rogues gallery for the first time in one night. Starting off, there's Black Mask, who's captured Commissioner Loeb in Blackgate Prison and eventually kills him. Working alongside him is Killer Croc to tear through the prison, destroy drones with important evidence on him, and hunt Batman. Yeah, that drone with important evidence, of course, tells Batman about all eight assassins after him, and he decides that Penguin would be the only person to have a drone like this and that he's been tracking Black Mask himself. So after dropping one of the Penguin's men into a fucking Christmas tree and tracking down the Penguin's location, Batman beats the absolute fucking shit out of Oswald while asking about the bounty, and Cobblepot eventually drops some info about Black Mask being assassinated. So after beating Deathstroke because he rudely interrupted the conversation and hearing some member of r slash anarchy rant on live TV, as if there isn't enough going on tonight, you head to Lacey Towers where you get to piece together the crime scene, finding out that while the cops think the Penguin was the killer because of fingerprints, it was actually someone else. But who? After breaking into the GCPD, hacking the National Criminal Database, having a brief interaction with Barbara that leads to Batman saying a basic but god it feels so good to hear a line, Why do you do what you do? Because I made a promise. Then hacking the telecom wires that Barbara told you about in that brief interaction, you're able to find out that the Penguin's handprints are there because he walked in on the result. What happened was Cyanus knew he was going to be assassinated, so he sent in a decoy and that's the body at the scene. Sneaking up on the assassin results in a fight that he lost, the man sets his place on fire and forces Cyanus to kill his own girlfriend before being kidnapped. And the person responsible is someone new on the block, someone never before seen in Gotham City. Someone unheard of, even to the world's greatest detective. The Joker. So, obviously, the main story of the game is about the Joker. After finding him, he reveals himself, and Black Mask immediately goes to the sideline of the story and ends up no longer in the main story, only appearing once in a side mission, but by then, the main story has been completely taken out by the Joker. And those other assassins also completely push off to the sidelines. Copperhead, Bane, and Firefly show up during the main story, and Bane even gets a second and third boss fight, while Shiva and Deadshot become side missions. Joker's taken over Gotham, hired all those assassins, and after being saved by Batman and sent off to Blackgate instead of being left to die, he becomes obsessed with Batman's no-kill rule, which he admits to by gaslighting this innocent psychiatrist, Harleen Quinzel, into believing he's talking about her. So anyways, instead of going to therapy, Joker takes over Blackgate and forces Batman to either kill Bane, him, or die instead. 
Speaking of Bane, there's this random moment in the story right before Firefly attacks the bridge. Where you find out that Bane knows of Batman's identity. And before Bruce is able to get to Alfred, Bane's already shown up to the manor, destroy the Batcave, and when it comes to Alfred... I have left enough life in him for some final words. If you hurry... Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! You revive Alfred using the electric shock gloves, and Bruce immediately goes into sad boy blame everything on himself mode and quits being Batman for five seconds until Alfred tells him he now sees what is out in Gotham and that it needs Batman. So that's cool and all, but obviously Bane doesn't know Batman's identity in the previous game, so this plotline goes absolutely nowhere with Bane losing his memory at the end of his final fight. I get that the studio wanted to do something different, and the idea of someone in Batman's rogues gallery, especially someone as strong as Bane knowing Knowing his identity is great and terrifying, but it amounts to nothing in the end but Bane getting amnesia. So like, why? <laughs> I also want to note that this whole part of the story is built off this argument between Bruce and Alfred that I do genuinely really love, but I can't help but notice some comparisons. <laughs> Master Bruce, stop! Master Bruce! Bruce, you... I will not in good conscience allow you to go. You're outmatched by these assassins. What? You're not some hardened vigilante. You're a young man with a trust fund and too much anger. You're in over your head and I... I don't want this to be your end. Alfred, who are you talking to right now? Who do you see when you look at me? The boy whose shoes you used to tie every morning? The teenager you drove to his first date? Who is it? You think you see? While you are here every night, I am out there. The only thing between the innocent you and the may predator. be. No, not may be. I am. When the mugger or the thief stops to think twice, that is fear. That is what I am. That is why they hired assassins, because I am the reason the criminals breathe easier when the sun rises. Do you know what would happen if I suddenly decided to stop going into work? It ceases to exist without me. No, you clearly don't know who you're talking to, so let me clue you in. I am not in danger. I am the danger. So no, Alfred. I am not in over my head. Tonight, I will not end. But it will be theirs. I am the one who knocks. Anyways, Batman kills Bane, but just for a few moments, letting Joker escape before reviving Bane the same way he revived Alfred. After the final boss fight with Bane and wiping his memory, Batman meets up with the Joker and beats the shit out of him while he begs for an answer as to why the no-kill rule, which he never finds out because Batman puts an insane sense of fear into his eyes and then knocks him the fuck out. He does explain why to Gordon, though, before doing the classic disappear for the second time. Gordon learns to respect Batman, who takes one last final glide. If you stay through the credits long enough, you get to hear the Joker singing Cold Cold Heart in reference to the end credit singing of Only You When You Alone in Arkham City. And if you stay even longer, you get to hear Dean Snyder being interviewed by Jack Ryder talking about the events of this night. A guest named Hank steps in disagreeing with them, and then Quincy Sharp disagrees with all of them and raises a promise to build Arkham Asylum. <laughs> So yeah, pretty much the entire story becomes focused on the Joker right around the second half, which upset a lot of people because all the marketing for this game was focused on Black Mask. You start the game focusing on Black Mask, and then it just switches around to focus on the Joker as the main villain for the third time in the series instead of giving literally anyone else the chance. Or the fact that the game's set up with these eight assassins out for Batman's head, and instead of that being the primary thing, which... Would have been interesting both gameplay and story-wise, they're just pushed off to the sideline for Joker. And while I get that, and it's perfectly valid, I personally don't really care. Like, yeah, the story set up from the beginning is promising and sounds like an interesting game, but I also really like Joker as much as the next guy and think Troy Baker's performance is really good, so I don't really have anything to complain about. I like being around the Joker. I also just think that the story is really good. The origins in the title of the game isn't really about Batman's origins, though they do show the Wayne's death and unlike an asylum, this is dumb, it's pointless, please stop. But it more serves the origin of not only just the Joker, but the relationship between the two. Yeah, we get a bit of an adaptation of the original Red Hood story in a way that I think is done pretty well, giving the player the control of the Joker as we travel through a nightmare rendition of what happened that night, with hints of the fear that Batman put in the Joker all while hearing him talk about the Bat in a way that, like I said, 
manipulates Harleen. But more importantly, the game gives us an origin to the iconic relationship that the two have, at least in this universe. With Joker being someone new to the scene, someone so full of chaotic evil that Batman has never seen before, which leaves him astonished, sickened, and almost curious, while on the other side, Joker's become obsessed with the no-kill rule and trying to figure out why Batman doesn't kill, and why he views himself as better than all the other criminals. Why Batman doesn't see himself as the insane man that he is. Which, yeah, is your typical origin story for the relationship between the two, but... I don't know. I think it's done pretty well. When it comes to those assassins, though, some of them are dealt pretty well, in my opinion, and others, not so much. As I said before, Shiva gets entirely pushed off to be a side mission, one that doesn't even feel like it belongs in the game, to be honest. Leaving the Gotham Bank after the Joker reveal, you can hear a baby crying. Going towards the sound, you find a carriage that turns out to only have a speaker playing Baby Crying on MP3, which is when Shiva pops up out of nowhere, you counter her, and then it's just a bit of vague dialogue before she disappears. She mentions an innocent man about to die, so proceed to not care about for 40 minutes until I randomly heard a guy yelling for help. There's a cop hanging above a pool of electrical water, so you turn off the power by breaking the circuit breakers, which both ones you break result in having to fight Talia, I mean Shiva's guardians. After saving the cop, you're told about another cop to save, but showing up to the location only results in a dead body, and Shiva popping up once again for you to counter, then listen to more nothing dialogue. Later on, you meet Shiva in the Wonder City Tower, fight Rachel, I mean Shiva, until one final counter where she ends the match, says some shit that sounds strangely similar to what Rache and Talia were saying, and then you're done. Shiva disappears, and you never see her again. I doubt tonight's the last I'll see of Shiva. Well, in this universe it is. So yeah, like I said, this feels like a last minute addition to the game and is so pointless. The only reason to do it is for 100% or because you're working on a retrospective for the series. That's it. Copperhead comes off less useless than Shiva for the fact that she actually appears in the story and does something, but that something is so fucking stupid, pointless, and immediately goes nowhere that it begs the question on why the fuck she was even here to begin with. Oh, typical woke feminist left-wing SJW libtard bullshit. Changing Copperhead to a woman. He's supposed to be a guy. Stop forcing everything to be woke. Make your own woke shit. Look, I know I'm a changed man and all, but you are lying to yourself if you want this over this. After getting poisoned by her, you're on the hunt for the cure. So it's off to Wonder City, I mean the main room that you came in from, to get the cure that Alfred just sent. Along the way, you get visions of dead people blaming Batman and fighting multiple copperheads. Her actual boss fight is basically just a combat challenge with a bunch of fake copperheads and occasionally the real one, with some moments where it's just a one-on-one -on -one until eventually you knock her out. It's an actual boss fight compared to Shiva, but the poison plotline is so fucking dumb. There is no way I could possibly think that Batman's in danger when I know that in the timeline, there's five other games to happen. No matter how many times I play this game, I don't think I will ever remember what to do for the Killer Croc fight until I'm already partway through it. <laughs> My natural assumption is that it's like the Titan fights in Asylum, but it's actually like the Titan fights in City. And despite comparing this to Titan fights, I don't hate it. The fight goes pretty quick, and it is the first boss in the game about 15 minutes in, so it's fine. I'd say Asylum's croc fight is better, but this isn't bad. There's three total boss fights with Bane, but two of them pretty much being the same thing, and both of those just being a Titan boss fight. I think the first one is better than the second one, with the latter being at Blackgate, where you have to kill Bane. It's just the same as the first one, only it goes by really quick. The former, however, starts off with a cutscene that shows how fucking terrifying Bane is in this game. Then it's just a titan fight in a room until it's a titan fight outside where goons get introduced, I almost die, and then the cops show up at the end. Again, they're just titan fights. It's alright. Unlike with Croc though, I do think these are better than Asylum, but it does get even better. Deadshot ends up being another side mission, but not only is it better than Shiva, it's also better than his Arkham City counterpart. Going to a distress flare results in a helicopter flying up, ready to kill Batman before getting shot out of the sky. Investigating the crime scene, you find out that the shooter was none other than Deadshot, who left a radio frequency on one of his bullet casings. Listening to said frequency, Deadshot tells you to meet him at the Gotham Bank. At the bank, you get a typical Predator mission, but with Deadshot in the room, aiming at wherever you've last made noise. Which, yeah, sounds like your typical goon during a mission like this, but the difference is those goons don't have a red dot that'll bounce a bullet all over the place until it hits directly where you were at. 
This shit is so cool, not gonna lie. Then at a certain point, Deadshot will take hold of a victim, where you then do the typical sneak up on him and take him down, ending his fight. I say it's better than City because at least it's actually something. Like, okay, there's a debate to be made on which setup is better. City has a natural progression throughout its mission, building up the fight, but only for the fight to be so lackluster and almost nothing. Origins, on the other hand, has a pretty quick setup, but it's also a cool one. But it also leads into an actual fight that at least feels like an encounter Batman would have with Deadshot. Like, yeah, the fight is your typical Predator mission with one new thing added, but that's still better than wait until his back is turned to crawl through a grate and immediately take him down with the push of one button. Vayne's third boss fight is usually one of the most terrifying things I will ever play in a video game. After bringing him back to life, because of course, Vayne goes super fucking hard mode on the TN1, causing him to just be a wall of testosterone, where you have to avoid him at all costs, not being able to go one-on-one -on -one with him, having to hide in grates either in the walls or the floors, waiting until you can get a hit on Bane and knock him into the electrocuted gates. Oh, and there's this also fun thing where Bane will kind of pull a Mr. Freeze and will start tearing open gates and grabbing for you, causing you to lose out on possible takedowns, places to hide, and anxiety-induced moments like this. And then there's a moment where your detective vision goes out and you can't use it anymore. Fun. In this playthrough, I ended up spending all of the fight just hiding in any grate I possibly could, only being able to get Bane electrocuted twice, and instead just sneaking up on him many times, enacting a takedown, and then running for dear life to the next grate I could get into as soon as possible. This is easily the best Bane fight in the entire series, and knocks all the previous ones out of the park. This shit truly puts in the fear of Bane, and is the main reason why Origins put said fear of him into me. Keep in mind, Batman's on year two when doing this. I can't imagine the amount of paralyzing fear I would be in, let alone actually trying to survive. I would just end up dying immediately. <laughs> I know Batman's a fictional character, but I honestly have so much respect for him because he has to put up with shit like this on a daily basis. I could never. Firefly has a really cool and unique boss fight with him taking over the bridge, bombs planted, and of course him flying around burning everything. The bombs include your typical Predator missions, nothing too bad. The platforming you get to do on the broken bridge on your way to the third and fourth bomb is pretty cool. After defusing all the bombs, you head back up to the bridge, knock out a couple goons, and then start the boss fight where you dodge his attacks, throw the glue grenade onto him, then quick fire as many batarangs as possible. After a certain point, you're able to grab him with the back claw and pull him down. You then end up heading to another part of the bridge in a very natural way that's much better than how I'm explaining this. Do what you previously did all over again until his health is finished, but the fight isn't. Now you gotta dodge all the bombs he's throwing at you until you can grapple onto him, fly around the sky while countering his attacks, and eventually bring him back down to the ground and knocking him out. It's an incredibly fun boss fight packed with action that I really enjoy. I also like all the set changes throughout it, the platforming, and just the overall aesthetic of the burning bridge. Deathstroke is what many consider to be the best boss fight in the entire game, and to some even one of the best in the whole franchise. And I agree with that. Now I swear a long time ago I saw someone make a comparison between this fight and the Ra's al Ghul fight in Arkham City, showing that these two moments are the same, therefore same exact fight. Now I thought I knew where I heard this from, but after looking at it again I can't seem to find this moment anywhere, so it might be from a completely different video, something I misunderstood, or just plain and simply something I completely made up. But I've been wanting to argue against this point for years now, so I'm going to. <laughs> Welcome to my channel, where I argue against points and no one's even made. <laughs> I know I've given this game a bit of shit for the amount of copying it does, and I will continue to do more of that later, but when it comes to the Deathstroke fight, I feel like it's a lot different. Yes, the animation is the same, but the context isn't. The fight between Raish and Deathstroke are fundamentally different, with the Raish fight having you fight against clones of him, dodge the massive sword and shurikens while trying to shoot the remote electrical charge through a gap in his wall. And when this animation plays, it results in flashing back into reality for a quick moment, then going back into the fight. While in Deathstroke, it's completely one-on-one, -on -one, a lot of countering at the exact moment, a lot of different animations happening in between hits and throughout the fight. Sometimes Deathstroke will even draw a tank at you. Whenever this animation plays, though, it's followed up with immediately a beatdown. I'm just saying, the gameplay is immensely different, and it's enough to the point that it's a completely different fight, as well as one of the best in the series. 
Like, goddamn, WB Montreal fucking knew how to make a Batman versus Deathstroke fight. Hand-to-hand -hand close combat, matching the skills at martial arts, and it's just up to who can outsmart the other. The animations are also fucking great. That's something I've never praised a single boss fight ever for, because it's never something I think about. But here, just the way Bruce and Slade move is so hypnotic to watch. I love it. The gameplay is pretty much pressing X whenever you can, occasionally pressing Y, and sometimes you get to spam the ever-living shit out of X, and yet, it's all entertaining. Having to time your counter move perfectly, waiting for the pop-up to show because if you do it too early, you fail, which could be a bug, and if it is, it's one of the greatest bugs of all time. Each act of the fight is separated by Batman breaking something as Slade's, first the mask, then his staff, then ending with knocking him out against the blade of his own sword. It's all great. I love this boss fight. It's nowhere near better than Mr. Freeze, but I'd say it's the second best boss in the entire franchise. There is one boss fight, though, that I think tops Mr. Freeze. A boss fight so complicated, so meticulous, so eventful, that it would take far too long for me to explain what happens and would just be easier for me to play the entire fight for you. So you can watch in awe and glory the greatest fight in possibly any video game ever made. Looking for Black Mask. Where is he? <laughs> I ain't here to talk. I'm here to kick your ass. This is your last chance. Name yourself after an animal, and you're gonna get eaten. I know. Intimidating, ain't I? You about for be taught a lesson in pain. Just think of me as a bat zapper. Now, come to the light. This fight will be two hits. Me hitting you, and you hitting 50,000 volts. Black Mask must be out of his mind to put up 50 million for your head. Name yourself after an animal, and you're gonna get eaten. <laughs> There's also your side missions that include Shiva and Deadshot, but also Riddler, known as Enigma in this game, Bird, Black Mask, Anarchy, The Penguin, The Mad Hatter, Black Ape Prisoners, and Case Files. Case Files and Black Ape Prisoners end up being tied with the fact that you don't get the latter until you finish the former. In Case Files, you do exactly that. Go to crime scenes, use the crime scene detective mode feature that's very fun to use. <laughs> Solve the crime, find the criminal, give him a concussion, and then have Alfred send all the evidence to the GCPD. They're fine. You get to play with the crime scene detective mode a bit more, which is fun. After finishing the final crime scene, you get a call from Gordon saying that a bunch of black gay prisoners escaped during the riot at the end of the game, and with each criminal being marked on your map, you just have to go to them, knock him out, and let Gordon know. After knocking out all 20, Gordon calls, thanking Batman, to which he requests for the police to not bother him, ending the mission. I honestly don't know what you would want me to say about this. It's pretty much just a reskin of the Riddler goons. Beat them up, interrogate them, knock them out, done. Do this 20 times and that's the entire quest. I got nothing to say because there's nothing here to talk about. The only thing I can say is that I like how it shows the beginning of Batman and Gordon working with each other. That's pretty much it. Bird is the most useless ass side mission I think I've ever seen in a game. Like, it's not terrible. Before heading off to Bane's Lair, you can go look for his Lieutenant Bird, which requires you to go fight a bunch of goons and interrogate one of them, then do that again on the other side of Gotham, only this time you can scan a leak of venom, allowing you to find out where Bird is located. Heading to my alibi nightclub, you'll find Bird beating up the club owner, so then you beat him up along with some goons, interrogate him, and knock him out. It's not great, but it's not terrible. What makes it useless, though, is that you can do this quest whenever you feel like after getting it. Which makes sense, except the mission only makes sense if you do it before ending the story, because if you do it afterwards, this makes no goddamn sense. Putting you away should set him back. What do you mean? Man has amnesia. I mean, 
I guess you could look at it in a way where once Bane gets out of Blackade or Arkham or wherever the hell they send him to, he could easily just go meet up with Bird and continue where he left off for the most part. Except for his brain was damaged due to the TN1 causing him to forget Batman's entire identity. I think by then he's already forgotten about Bird and his plan. The Black Mask chemical mission is literally just the Bane Titan mission in Arkham City, but... Worse? Yeah, I'd say worse. The actual destruction of the containers is pretty much the exact same. It's when you get to the last one that requires you to go to the church. After taking down the goons, unlocking the cage that the containers are in using a code that's dark but makes no sense as to why that's the answer and blowing it up, Sionis and a group of his thugs show up out of nowhere, an admittedly kind of funny interaction between the two happened. Now we can do this the easy way. Or yeah, yeah, or, or the hard way. But I think you know my choice. And then you knock out everyone and lock up Sionis. And that's the end of the mission. That is all. It's pretty much an almost carbon copy of the Bane mission. Only it's missing the part where you get to fight alongside with Bane, so that's why I say it's worse. <laughs> Anarchy shows up pretty early on in the game. He was that r slash Anarchy guy I mentioned earlier. He's planted three bombs where Gotham's corruption is at its strongest. I've planted three bombs. I've planted three bombs where Gotham's corruption is at its strongest. I've planted three bombs where Gotham's corruption is at its strongest. I've planted three bombs where Gotham's corruption is at its strongest. I've planted three bombs where Gotham's corruption is at its strongest. I've planted three bombs where Gotham's corruption is at its strongest. So you talk to anarchists who put you in the location of each bomb. Arriving at the locations, you fight a couple goons and then break the bomb. After the third bomb, Anarchy tells you to meet him at the courthouse. Going to the courthouse, Anarchy makes an offer to team up, and when Batman refuses, he drops this concerning line. You're just another rich kid atoning for his fiscal sins. Oh shit, is it that obvious? His boss fight is just a wave of goons before he comes down, to which you beat the shit out of him and find out he's just a teenager. I got nothing else. <laughs> I, I don't fucking care. I don't care about anarchy at all. I've, I've never given a shit. <laughs> the penguin doesn't really have much to do with the penguin. Once he locks himself up in his room, he's never to be seen again. Guess I couldn't get Nolan North for long, he had other things to do. The only relation this quest has to the Penguin is that it's his weapons caches that he's stealing. It's your typical beat up goons deactivate the thing missions, but with the added highlight of Barbara Gordon, who's the one who gives you the mission in the first place. Gotta say, working together is kind of fun. I mean, we're actually getting stuff done. And my dad thinks I'm just sitting in his office texting and watching TV. If only he knew. I like Barbara. She's cute. The rest of this mission is whatever, but I like hearing this pretty bad girl, Barbara. That's it, we did it! Well, you did most of it, but I helped, right? I think we make a pretty good team. So if you're ever, like, I don't know, looking for some kind of partner, I'm here for you. Anyway, I'll let you get back to kicking ass and keeping us safe. And you'll see, one day my father's gonna figure out just how cool I already know you are. I think that the Mad Hatter is on the list of things WB Montreal did better. Yeah, it's basically taking the Scarecrow levels from Asylum and giving him a Mad Hatter spin, but it's better than fighting endless goons on a clock floating in the void for a minute and a half. It's honestly just kind of fun. I love the ambience of the place and hearing Mad Hatter be absolutely fucking insane. And at the end of it, he sings a little song that I get stuck in my head far too fucking often. Help me! He can, he will, he just has to leave. He can, he will, he just has to leave. He can, he will, he just has to leave. Really now, you're becoming my pet peeve. He can, he will, he just has to leave. He can, he will, he just has to leave. He can, he will, he just has to leave. Seriously now, you're becoming my pet peeve. And of course, because it's an Arkham game, the Riddler is in here. Now, they could have just not, because this is a Batman origin story, but nah, it's also gotta be a Riddler origin story, and I, I don't think it's the worst Riddler, but I think it's easily the most pointless. The data packs, not trophies, are spread in the most basic cookie-cutter way. There's, of course, no riddles, because we're dealing with Enigma, who hasn't donned the Riddler title yet. There's barely any bit of a story... Yeah, a bit of dialogue when you take over the towers or end up flying by them, but he doesn't even comment when you get the data packs, which him sounding like a Redditor is what puts at least a bit of entertainment when collecting these damn things. And the lack of anything in Gotham, which we will talk about a bit later, makes this experience mostly fucking dead. 
And then the icing on the cake is once you gather every fucking data pack and go to meet up with Enigma, he's escaped and all you get is one Riddler trophy. One Riddler trophy. Okay, you could make a very good point on this being the worst Riddler with this disappointment of an ending. But personally, what I consider the worst Riddler requires the trophy gaining to be an absolute nuisance, which I don't really consider Origins to be that. Pointless? Very. But annoying and even rage-inducing? Nah, that's in another game. So like I said in the beginning, it's hard to call Arkham Origins a bootleg because the main story is honestly up to par with the rest of the franchise and in some cases better in my opinion. But at the same time, there's a lot that makes it feel like one. Yeah, you have all the moments where it's so obviously copying the previous games. Batman being poisoned along with the walking animation being the exact same. The Destro countering. Shiva's Guardians being reskinned Talia Guardians. The Black Mask chemical mission just being the Bane Titan containers from Arkham City. The Glue Grenade being a reskinned Freeze Grenade. The Disruptor just being a gun version of Arkham City's. Anarchy symbols being Armadeus Arkham symbols or the question mark riddles. But there's also parts of the gameplay like the grapnel boost. Never mind how it doesn't make any sense timeline-wise because it stayed in Arkham City. It's not yet ready for field deployment. It's still in the prototype stage. I understand why it's in the game. Gotham is much bigger than cities, so it makes flying around the place a lot better. But the problem is, the grapnel boost feels far worse here than it ever did in City. That, and along with the flying, it feels like if you modded it into Arkham Asylum, giving everything such a clunky feel. I used to always glide from one place to another, never taking the Batwing, but in this playthrough, any time I had to go to the other side of Gotham, I just took the Batwing there because it's faster and far easier than trying to glide all the way there. But don't get me wrong, there's still a lot of stuff I like from this game. Like, for example, I think that the combat is at its most brutal in this game. This is a much angrier Bruce, so instead of using the normal animations from the previous games, Origins brings in much more brutal depictions of bone breaking. Don't hurt me! I had a troubled child! That's not even including the moments in the cutscenes. Dropping loose lips into a Christmas tree, throwing Penguin and the Joker around the room, the way Electrocutioner's face gets caved in, or even just how fucking cool this scene is. The cutscenes in this game are so fucking great, I don't care. I know that they're pre-rendered 1080p compressed video cutscenes, and yeah, when I'm looking at 720p recorded game footage on my 4K monitor, it starts to show its wear, but on my 720p TV, it looks just fine. But also, I don't give a shit about graphics, and the game is from 2014, made on probably a lower budget, so even if the 4K monitor makes it look dated, that doesn't stop them from looking as fucking glamorous as they do. Oh my god, so many shots and scenes look so fucking beautiful. It's hard to list favorites because it's most of the cutscenes. Pretty much any cutscene with the Joker ends up being a massive highlight. It's noticeable that the devs put the most time and effort into making the Joker cutscenes the highest quality that they could possibly be. They always contain great usages of color and lighting. I love them. Speaking of the Joker, I might as well give my thoughts on Roger Craig Smith and Troy Baker as Batman and Joker, respectively. To coin an old phrase of mine, if you've seen my Joker performance tier list, then you'd know that I like Troy Baker's Joker, even outside of Arkham Origins. But focusing on his performance in this game alone, it's great. He nails the sound of a fresh Joker, soon to become Mark Hamill's performance, while still sounding unique and not just an attempt at Mark. And in general, if a Joker voice sounds pleasing and is saying things that sound like what Joker would say, that's all I need, and this game provides it. Roger Craig Smith, on the other hand, I like him and his Batman voice, but I feel like I like it more when it's not in an Arkham game. Like, in the Unlimited trilogy or Ninja Batman, he's in his own universe where that is how Batman sounds, and it works, and it sounds great, and it's a great Batman. But then I hear it in Arkham Origins, and all I can think of is that this Batman is supposed to grow into Conroy's voice, and I honestly just can't hear it. It's still a great Batman, but just not a young Conroy, you know? I, I will give one thing to the performance being in this game, though. It does fit with how brutal he is. With that being said, given how brutal this Batman is, WHY CAN'T HE PUNCH WOOD?!
This is a game design that I do not understand. Arkham City was built on the same engine, and this game really loves to take a lot from it, except for the function of punching wood for Riddler trophies? Why the fuck was this changed to having to use explosive gel? You telling me Batman can knock out people but not a thin piece of wood? Did the Arkhamverse Batman only learn how to punch wood after Arkham Asylum? Wait, Minecraft came out in the same year as that. Okay, you know what, actually, that does make sense. There are a couple interesting gadgets that the game adds. Of course, you have your basic set and the low-key rip-offs, but then you get the remote claw after beating Deathstroke, and that shit is my crutch that I often forget about. You see, during Predator missions, I just try to silent take down everyone in the room as possible, making great usage of the silent battering, my number one crutch. But with the addition of the remote claw, it gives me an extra two silent takedowns wherever the hell the game feels like it, and I love it. And then there's the shock gloves that you get from the Electrocutioner's death, and holy fuck, these things are the definition of OP. Second these babies are charged up- I think these are the only reason why I'm able to beat the first Bane fight. <laughs> Origins also introduces a new gameplay mechanic with the crime scenes, giving you a recreation of what happened, letting you scroll through the timeline of events and find where key objects may have gone. This is so cool that Rocksteady put this mechanic into Arkham Knight. I know they mentioned the time between Deathstroke and Firefly, but that's more out of necessity because they added the characters. Same reason goes for the shot gloves. That's just to explain why Batman doesn't have them in the main trilogy, because they needed to. But they didn't need to bring in this version of the crime scenes. They already made their own version forward with the perfect crime, but they decided to bring it in for the story because it's just that good. Also, a small note that I'm sure everyone's talked about, but I'd be remiss to not mention it. The Joker's theme in this game is a spin on Carol of the Bells, which not only just sounds fucking cool, but it also fits with the Christmas theme and this being such a damn good Christmas game. Overall, I think Arkham Origins is a pretty good game if you're just going through the story. I think that's why I've held it in such high regard for years, because the story is just really entertaining from beginning to end, both in writing and gameplay. When you get out of that is when the game shows all of its flaws. Most of the side missions are pointless, Riddler absolutely fucking sucks, Gotham's environment is pretty dead, and no, I'm not just talking about how everyone is inside for Christmas night, but like... I swear, at Arkham City, there were a lot more times I heard goons talking as I flew around the place, and it's definitely the case in Arkham Knight. Origins is just kind of lacking. You still get that banter, but not enough of it. But there's no rule that says I have to 100% a game any time I play it. I'm not the completionist. And with Origins, I just like running through the story at least once a year during Christmas time, and I always enjoy it. The boss fights are also really good, and some of them even better than the Rocksteady counterparts. I genuinely think WB Montreal made better fights for Deathstroke, Firefly, Bane, Mad Hatter, and Deadshot. Hell, I even think that the ending with the Joker was done better than Asylum. Okay, that might not be a hot take. Point is, I don't think this is an incompetent piece of the franchise. I highly suggest it if you want a fun story, brutal combat, glorious cutscenes, great boss fights, and just overall a very nice comfort game. Arkham Origins also got its fair share of DLC, including skin packs, combat maps, and a unique playable story called Cold Cold Heart. Hmm, I wonder what this is about. What the fuck? <laughs> Cold Cold Heart takes place on New Year's Eve, only a week after the events in the main story. During a New Year's party at the Wayne Manor that's also giving out the Humanitarian of the Year award to one Ferris Boyle, the place is crashed and frozen by none other than Mr. Freeze, who's here to kidnap Ferris. Turns out, the reason why he needs Ferris is half revenge and half in a desperate attempt to save Nora. You see, Ferris and Freeze had a deal where Freeze gets to help Ferris in his research towards a cryogenic weapon, while Ferris provides whatever Freeze needs to help find a cure for Nora. But Ferris had no intention of holding up his end, and only cared about how Freeze was able to freeze Nora in a cryogenic state. When Freeze knows about this, he decides to do the research all by himself, which Ferris obviously doesn't like, and somehow this causes Freeze to be given his frozen condition. I like this line that Batman says when he finds out the origin story of Freeze. All this violence. He's just trying to save his dying wife. It shows to me that WB Montreal knows what makes Freeze Freeze and what makes him so great. He's not the typical supervillain out to take over Gotham or the world or rob jewelry stores solely for the money. He doesn't care about any of that. He was just a normal guy with a dying wife that he's desperately trying to cure. 
capable of murder? Very, but only when he needs to. And whenever he needs to is when someone is in the way of him and his wife. God, I hope Matt decides to make Freeze the villain in the Batman 2, but I digress. That's pretty much the DLC story. Mr. Freeze is a new villain on the block. Here's his origin. Batman puts a stop to him, saves Nora, and sends Ferris to jail. Writing-wise, it's alright. Nothing too special, but nothing terrible. Gameplay-wise, it's about the same as everything else, aside from enemies now having a cryogenic gun that's an absolute pain in the ass to deal with. Any time I try to beat down these guys with everyone else around, I immediately have to counter every other goon in the room, and eventually, Batman will just forget about the main dude with the fucking cryo gun, and just focus on some other dude on the other side of the room. It makes me dread every time I see these guys in a large group of others. Batman also gets a couple upgrades of his own, with the most notable being the XE suit that not only heats up batarangs and turns the electro gloves to heat gloves, that still gives you the OP power that the gloves inherently have, but it also just looks extremely badass. This has got to be one of my favorite bat suits in the entire series. Even with how bulky it is, it still looks great and I love the full cover-up mask. I know the important thing with Batman's cowl is showing off his chin and that incredible jawline, but because of that, anytime I see a bat suit with that part of the mask covered up, it just inherently looks cool to me. While City let you play as Bruce Wayne in the beginning of the game, and it was only to walk around, fight one fight, and then climb up to the top of a roof, while Cold Cold Heart gives you several combat challenges as the Playboy Billionaire while on your way to the Batcave, which I think is pretty cool. I can't believe I forgot to talk about the Mr. Freeze fight. <laughs> Honestly, the fact that WB Montreal decided to make a DLC focusing on Freeze and giving him a boss fight for the basically modded Arkham City game that came out after City is pretty commendable. I mean, yeah, the fight can't hold a candle to Cities, but it's still pretty good, and a positive would be that it's unique. There's two stages of the fight, the first one having you try to overpower the cryo generators and blow them up while trying to not get caught by Freeze or the goons he's hired. After destroying all three generators, Freeze freezes the air and hops down onto the ground to fight one-on-one. -on -one. Though if you try to immediately fight one-on-one, -on -one, it doesn't go well. Trust me, I tried. <laughs> I ended up spending most of the fight on the gargoyles trying to take advantage of the icicles that you can drop down using batarangs, or your typical great takedowns. At a certain point, the cryo chamber holding Nora starts to fail, so Freeze freezes the air even more, making everyone but Batman into ice cubes, and completely ignoring Batman to try to save Nora. Again, loving how Freeze only gives a shit about Nora. Nothing matters, do you understand? Nothing but my Nora! While he's trying to fix the cryo chamber, you sneak underneath him and intact to take down, ending the fight with him, but it's not over just yet because somehow Boyle escaped, temporarily freezes Batman, and starts beating Freeze with a metal pipe, until you break out of your ice cube and beat the shit out of him, ending the DLC. Pretty good fight, and it doesn't try to be cities, that's, that's all I can really say. Overall, the DLC's alright, I guess. Like I said, there's nothing that bad about it, but it's also nothing really special in my opinion. It's got a good amount of story, gameplay, and time in it that I could see the $10 being worth it, but there's also just nothing too memorable from it. It's a fun ride, and I would recommend it if you want more Arkham Origins, as well as getting a bit more of Morris LaMarche's Mr. Freeze. Oh boy, yeah. Arkham Origins Blackgate is a game that should have never been made. The game was released on the same day as Arkham Origins and serving as a sequel, with Roger Craig Smith and Troy Baker reprising their roles as Batman and Joker respectively, and even including Catwoman voiced by Grey Delisle, so that's a plus. Unfortunately, that's the only plus I can give this game because this is total fucking utter dog shit. Okay, let me calm down. The game is a 2.5D side-scroller originally released for the 3DS and PS Vita. A deluxe version was released for Wii U, PS3, Xbox 360, and PC on April 1st, 2014. Honestly, a very good April Fool's joke. This is the version that I used because of convenience, and also, I don't own a 3DS or a PS Vita, let alone know how the hell you'd record gameplay for that, so PC it was. And I'm not sure if the porting made the game worse or if it was just this fucking bad on launch, but dear god. To give the game its credit, the transformation of the Arkham combat into 2.5D is done relatively well. For the most part, it works somewhat fine and still feels kind of like an Arkham game, though it will never not be funny how these unconscious goons just phase into the floor. And I think the concept itself is interesting, uh, why not put the Arkham gameplay into a different type of gameplay? And the game has these comic book style cutscenes that are cool, I guess? 
The game only gives you four gadgets, the Batarang, Backclaw, Line Launcher, and a twist on the explosive gel making it a gun. You know, now that I say that out loud... <laughs> I understand these changes given the 2.5D aspect of the game and the ways that they work is all right. Makes sense for the devices. The game also changes how the cryptographic sequencer works given how there's only one joystick on the 3DS. So instead of the normal form of code or wavelength using the two joysticks, you get a screen of numbers that you match with the right order. There's three stages of difficulty for these, mostly just to lock off certain sections until you get the relative key card because there's no difficulty in doing these. At best, the numbers get regenerated if you hover over a glitched out one, but that's about it. I do think it's an interesting change and I kinda like it. I would go into talking about the story, but the story really isn't anything. Batman meets Catwoman for the first time, and then two weeks later, there's a riot going on at Blackgate, so you spend the whole game there, going back and forth between the prison, and along the way, stopping the Penguin, Black Mask, and the Joker. And I guess at the end of the game, it's revealed that Catwoman is the main villain? I say I guess, because I didn't actually finish the game due to getting stuck at the goddamn Penguin fight. I think Dark Souls would probably be easier. Before I get to the penguin fight, I would like to talk about the other ones. Uh, at least the ones I played, because they're not as bad. I, no, no, they are. Bronze Tiger is the first boss fight in the game, and maybe I'm just stupid and everyone else who played this game was able to figure out everything they were supposed to do immediately, but I just find this fucking annoying. Not only did I get stuck in a loop of getting hit eight goddamn times before I figured out that you're supposed to roll under him instead of counter, hmm, I wonder where I would have gotten that fucking impression, or how only six times do you get to fucking press X. Like, even in the Deathstroke fight, do you get to just beat him up because this is a fucking Arkham game and that's what I expect. But nah, you spend most of the fight just waiting around to press Y or until the game tells you to press B. I, I, I can't even remember if I was this angry playing it, but just watching my footage fucking pisses me off and I can't really explain why, except for I loathe this game's existence. The Deadshot fight starts off... I'll admit, pretty cool with you having to run and hide while in the viewpoint of Deadshot's scope. But then you get a moment like this where the millisecond I moved, the game stopped me from having control to have Deadshot shoot a spotlight and then shoot me before I'm able to move again. And right after that where the game goes, hey, you know how hiding behind something covers you from getting hit? Well, fuck you anyways. I, I refuse to look at this and say it makes sense. Even with 1 16th of my cape being shown, he shoots the wall! I guess all of a sudden he just has a wall piercing bullet. And I'm glad that after knocking out three goons, the game decided to replenish my health. I have no idea if that was a glitch or not, but I, I wouldn't be surprised given how goddamn broken and inconsistent this game is. And the fight ends with you shining a spotlight onto him so you can hit him with a line launcher. I guess it's not the worst thing this game has to offer and it is an interesting take on a fight between the two. Maybe even better than the one in Origins, but I'm, I'm surprised it didn't break more. Like even where I had to climb up and had a moment where I was getting shot before I could crouch, I'm genuinely surprised the game didn't have me just get stuck standing there until I died. Solomon Grundy's the next one. I had to look up a tutorial on how to beat him. Like with the next three fights. The first attack is pretty simple enough with you exploding an electrical box, having the wire get charged and electrocuting him as he runs towards you. This causes a charged wire to start hanging from the ceiling. So naturally, I thought all I had to do was get him to run into it. But I guess despite how massive this dude is, he's only one pixel beneath the wire and it doesn't harm him. No, what you're supposed to do is put explosive gel on a sewer grate and explode it as he walks over it, causing him to fall into the wire. If you've played this game before, can, can you tell me if you figured this one out on your own? Or am I just stupid? And then the final thing you do is combine both attacks into one and then he's defeated. What a stupid fucking fight. I was gonna make this point with the Bronze Tiger fight, but this feels a bit more appropriate given the three and a half minutes of me running back and forth before I eventually gave up and looked for a tutorial. This game gives you no hints for anything. If you're stuck, you're stuck. Fuck you. Maybe that's a cost from this being a 3DS and PS Vita game. I, I don't... I don't know. It just feels aggravating when Arkham City gives you a list of things to do if you get stuck at the freeze fight, but fucking okay. Black Mask is when the game introduces this fun feature where the villains become stupidly overpowered. 
Like, I'm sorry, but there is no reason why Black Mask, of all people, should be able to just hammer you with non-stop bullets until your death at the slight notice of your location. And this isn't the only time this game does this stupid-ass mechanic. Okay, let me run you through my thought process while doing this. You throw a batarang and an alarm on the other side of the room to get Black Mask to face towards it and have his back turned towards you, letting you enter one of the floor grates. So naturally, when I'm on the other side of the room, closest to Black Mask, and he somehow can't see me through his peripheral vision, I guess the mask is just shit, I assume that I throw another batarang at the other alarm on the left side, causing him to turn his back to me and give me an opening. Right? No! Because apparently Black Mask all of a sudden has eyes in the back of his head and can immediately spin around and kill me. Nah, instead you do the alarm stuff, but instead of just taking advantage of his back turned, you wait until he walks so you can take him down through a grate? Why? It's like the game punishes you for thinking. It, it gives you the setup for you to piece together the solution just for it to go fuck you because you didn't think of the most out-of-pocket conclusion. It's like the fucking game equivalent of Sherlock. This game somehow, and I can't believe it, manages to make a worse Joker fight than Arkham Asylum. I mean, I guess if you want to look through the lens of Joker is inconsistent, so an inconsistent fight makes sense, but it's just a fucking nuisance. This entire fight consists of running around in circles and using the line launcher to try to hit him, but with the microscopic frame-by-frame -frame timing of a fucking Smash Bros tournament and Joker constantly changing direction. Again, maybe I'm just really fucking bad at video games, but this fight sucks and I never want to experience it again. And finally... The Penguin. This fight consists of nothing but the Penguin standing in one location and occasionally sending out goons that are literally invincible. Because they have these fucking Fallout New Vegas flamethrower looking ass machine guns that never require them to ever reload that at a moment's notice of seeing you barrage you with bullets until you're dead. The only way you can stop them is to rip it off their back. But fuck you if someone else catches you doing it because they'll start shooting causing the other person to start shooting and then bada bing bada boom you're dead. But double fuck you if the goon randomly decides to just say no and turn around and shoot you. Oh, and if you think that getting the penguin down on the floor and the game zooming in the camera so you can only see the two of you makes it so you're fine from the goons, fuck you it does because if one off screen that you have no idea is there sees you, he'll start shooting at you and then you're dead! If you get spotted once, even for a millisecond, it's game over. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Just reset the mission and keep trying and keep dying. Chuck this up with the atrociously inconsistent gameplay mechanics. Do you think running off a platform in a 2D platform means you can run off the platform? No, fuck you, there's an invisible wall and you're dead. Oh, please. I will hunt you down and kill you. That is literally where all my gameplay footage ends. That happened, I punched my chair three times and then uninstalled the game. I- I am not kidding. I literally became this guy, but instead of my desk, it was the arm of my chair. You know, I was introduced to video games when I was about seven years old, and played a decent amount of games throughout the years. I've had my fair share of rage-inducing moments. I once threw my controller and it hit the window because I kept dying on Black Mountain in New Vegas. But I have never had a game consume me with the amount of violence and vitriol that this piece of dog shit gave me when it wouldn't let me run off a goddamn ledge. Not to mention the sheer annoyance of having to always scan every room in order to do anything. Or how if you die in a boss fight, the check mark isn't at the beginning of the fight, it's right beforehand, so you have to go through the slight inconvenience of skipping a cutscene, which gets really fucking annoying when you keep dying and how both these features get intertwined. You think scanning a room once is good enough? Nah, you died and you have to re-enter the room, meaning you've forgotten everything in it and have to scan the room again, and again, and again, and again, every fucking time. How many times do I have to scan a fucking item? I've, I've scanned 30 of these alarms and gates and switches. I think I should know what these are by now. Why do you have dementia?
There's also the moments where the game is just an annoying waste of time having you get all the way to the end of a section just to tell you to pick something up in a completely different section, making you walk all the way back to the beginning and then walk all the way through the other section, grab the item, and then walk all the way back to the fucking entrance and then walk all the way through back to where you were just to open a fucking door. Armature Studio should feel bad. Fuck this game and its entire existence. Technically, I have to give it a DNF out of 10, but in my heart... I honestly can't believe the next game is less rage-inducing. <laughs> Arkham Knight was released on June 23rd, 2015, and this is how the Batman died. Well, okay then. Arkham Knight takes place nine months after City. Following the Joker's death, Scarecrow takes over Gotham with plans of filling the city with his fear gas. After a warning, everybody except for the thugs and some of the rogues gallery is evacuated, leaving Batman to take down Scarecrow. But that's not all, because Scarecrow has brought a newcomer to town, the Arkham Knight, who is full of vengeance towards Batman and wants him dead. Who's the Arkham Knight? Nobody knows. But coincidentally, Batman starts getting visions of Jason Todd. This probably doesn't have any connection, though. But wait, th there's more. After getting a heavy dose of Scarecrow's fear toxin, Batman starts hallucinating the Joker, popping up here and there, making sarcastic comments about anything and everything happening. So obviously, the main story of the game, because the cause of the Joker's appearance isn't just because of the fear gas. I mean, that plays a part in it, but ultimately it's because of the poison Joker's blood that Batman was injected with back in Arkham City. Okay, so first of all, we already have a big problem with the fact that I watched Batman inject himself with a cure back in City. Are you saying that the cure containing Rachel Ghoul's blood and perfected by Mr. Freeze was only good enough to stop Batman from dying, but not good enough to stop him from becoming the Joker? Oh yeah, that's another part of this story. Apparently, some of the poison blood ended up in four victims, slowly turning them all into different versions of the Joker. So you're also telling me that the Joker's blood fermented with Titan just turns people into him? I know the Batman universe has some of its dumb moments, but this is a whole different level of stupidity. I mean, yeah, when adapting fictional characters, you can do whatever you want, regardless of how stupid or brilliant it is, but making Joker's Titan-infected blood be able to turn people into him makes absolutely no sense. The reason why the Joker is the Joker is because of the vat of acid he fell into, and as far as I know, that has nothing to do with his blood, nor should being injected with it. Should it automatically turn people into him? But okay, the Joker's blood turns people into him and it's turning Batman into the Joker. I guess that's what we're doing here. This goes barely anywhere. Those four victims, they all die. The other guy that's supposedly not being affected turns out to actually be affected and he kills the other three, then himself. And that's just where that ends. The only thing this part of the story does is set up a mission around Harley wanting the victims to herself in a false sense of keeping the Joker. But even after that, this whole Joker's blood plotline builds up in the story to just a moment during the end where Joker's fully taking control of Batman's mind and an admittedly fun section in which you take control of the Joker and get to shoot things, which is pretty cool in an Arkham game. You go through the section watching Joker slowly realize that he's been completely forgotten by Gotham, which ends up being his biggest fear. This all builds up to a moment where Batman locks Joker away in an Arkham-like cell and pushes him away into the depths of his mind to be forgotten forever. During this, we get the infamous I am the Knight quote, which... I get it's an iconic line, but I, I'm, I'm just gonna be honest, I'm a bit tired of hearing it. It made sense in its original context, and I found since then it just becomes this HE SAID THE THING, OMG, HE SAID THE THING! Whenever it's been used again, especially in this context, is there any reason why Batman says this? In the animated series, it's because of the Scarecrow's fear gas making him manifest his father telling him he's a disgrace. In here, it's just, hey, Joker, I am the Knight, I am Vengeance, I am Batman, okay, goodbye, I'm cured now. I will give this section one thing, the final line for the Joker is great. The way Mark desperately croaks out that, I need you, as the Joker gets pulled into the background and the doors close sends chills through my body. With all that being said, as much as I don't agree with having Joker in the game, I'd be lying if I said I didn't have a smile on my face anytime he showed up. I'm sorry, it's Mark Hamill, I'm never not gonna love it. Scarecrow's story is what starts the game, but it quickly gets sidelined, not once, but twice. But even if he hadn't, it's not that good. 
Scarecrow decides to fill Gotham with his new batch of fear toxins, so before doing this, he unleashes the gas amongst the diner as a warning sign, and allows everyone in the city to evacuate before he unleashes it onto the many goons and rogues gallery characters still willing to stay. Okay, so instead of dosing the innocent with this deadly toxin, we're gonna dose all the criminals. Don't entirely see why, but okay. Scarecrow goes for Ace Chemicals, but that fails, so he conveniently has a backup, which is the Cloudburst, but that fails because of Arkham Knight's stubbornness and Poison Ivy giving up her life to clean up Gotham. So with his two plans failed and no more gas, Scarecrow resorts to making his whole plan about exposing Batman's identity in front of Gotham on Twitch.tv to rob the people of Gotham's hope. Oh, and why is he doing this? Well, I guess because of Killer Croc mangling his face back at an asylum. I guess you could say that's Batman's fault for getting in the way, but like... In the end, it was Croc who turned you into that. Why are you going after Batman and Gotham for it? Yeah, Scarecrow's story barely makes any sense to me. I don't see the purpose in giving Gotham a warning and let all the innocent people leave and just the villains and crooks get to suffer. That sounds more anti-hero than villain to me. And yeah, it could be explained away with the bat tank and not wanting the player to actually hurt innocent people, but that's from a gameplay perspective. And looking through that, it makes sense. But looking at it through a writing perspective, it doesn't. All it does is make Scarecrow look dumb and make no sense. The have to expose Batman's identity also just seems to come out of nowhere in this desperation to do anything since all his other plans failed. Which I mean... That is a way of looking at it, and it could make sense from that perspective, that Scarecrow literally is grasping for anything to do since Batman foiled his other plans. Seems a bit dumb to me, though. And then we got the Arkham Knight plotline. A strange new villain who says that he knows everything about Batman. He knows how he thinks. We know how you think! So obviously, he sends unmanned- Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Point is, he knows Batman and all of his tricks, and he intends to use that knowledge to finally bring the Dark Knight down, killing him once and for all, training the militia everything that he knows, but that doesn't mean shit, the AI dumb on easy mode. <laughs> he also has many chances of killing Batman, but never does, sorry. Batman has no idea who this Arkham Knight is and spends the entire story not really focusing on it and just having Alfred do all the research in the background and occasionally chime in after an event with a knight about how he doesn't have an identity yet. Coincidentally enough, Joker mentions Jason Todd a fair bit and Batman starts having these visions of his death. That's quite odd. I wonder if this has anything to do with it does. If you played the game, you know how painfully obvious it is the entire time. I think the only way this was able to actually be somewhat successful to me when I first played it was because I had no idea who Jason Todd was, or Red Hood, or even Death in the Family. Arkham Knight fucking sucks. There's a great video essay by Vigil about how the identity of the Arkham Knight being Jason Todd doesn't work, and I would highly recommend watching it because he basically makes most of the points that I initially had, but there's some stuff that I personally want to say. I think the Arkham Knight basically being a reskinned Red Hood doesn't work for many reasons. First of all, the Joker's dead in this universe, which basically gets rid of the whole point of Red Hood's character. Jason's anger towards Batman for letting the Joker live after he killed him is fundamentally what makes the character. Bruce, I forgive you for not saving me. But why? Why on God's earth? Is he still alive? You know, I thought... I thought I'd be the last person you'd ever let him hurt. If it had been you that he'd beat to a bloody pulp, if he had taken you from this world, I would have done nothing but search the planet for this pathetic pile of evil death-worshipping garbage and send him off to hell! I'm not talking about killing Penguin or Scarecrow or Dent. I'm talking about him. Just him. And doing it because... because he took me away from you. And so when Joker's already dead, what is there for Jason to be mad at? Well, I guess it's that Batman didn't come and rescue him and instead just replaced him, which, I'm sorry, that's just not Batman. Oh, but Joker sent a tape of him killing Jason to Batman. Yeah, but that's after he shows Jason a photo of Tim Drake, meaning Batman would have had replaced him before even knowing he was dead, which I can't possibly see that being a thing Batman would do. In both the original A Death in the Family and Under the Red Hood comics, Batman goes to save Jason but ends up being too late. I just don't see Batman refusing to try to save a member of his family and instead opt into just replacing him immediately. The man who's so against death that he became the Dark Knight to put a stop to it and only has one rule which is no killing, 
yeah, would totally just not bother to go save a Robin. It doesn't even matter that it's Jason. If it was Dick, Tim, Alfred, Barbara, Jim, Selena, Talia, Damien, anyone who he gives a fuck about and deems as any bit close to family, he would go and save. I refuse to believe he would just immediately replace him. There's a Batman Beyond episode where Bruce can't get a hold of Terry, so he sees if Max knows anything, and when she doesn't, he goes out into the streets of Gotham in the subway looking for him. And this is an 80-year-old Bruce. The man quit being Batman because of his old age, but will still go out of his way to find Terry. Fucking hell, Batman went to Apocalypse by himself, fought Darkseid, and won just to recover Damien's dead body. So fuck you if you seriously think I'm gonna believe he just immediately replaced Jason. And even if somehow Tim was recruited after Bruce saw the footage of Jason's death, I still just don't think he would take the footage at face value. We're talking the greatest detective here. You're seriously gonna sit here and tell me he just watched cam footage and went, all right, well, that's all the evidence I need and not even bother to go check himself? In the Justice League episode here after, Bruce literally watched Superman die right in front of his eyes and he didn't believe it. I'm not going to the funeral. Why? Because he's not dead. And yes, he did end up being right, but he watched with his own eyes Right in front of him, Superman just evaporate out of existence, and Price's ex to Dow only shows up to the funeral in the shadows and spends most of his time off camera away from the Justice League trying to search for Clark. He won't even believe in his own eyes, but you're trying to tell me he'll believe in the fucking Joker of all people? I think that's the most offensive part about this entire story plot is that somehow Rocksteady wants me to believe that Batman would take the fucking Joker at face value. Why on earth would he believe in anything that the Joker says or does? With Joker, expect the unexpected. The man of nothing but chaos and lies. Hmm, yes, Batman would totally believe him and not do any actual research of his own. I'm sorry, but that just seems like the least Batman thing to do right next to gunning down people. But even with all of that out of the way, all the comic book accuracy bullshit and just focus on the character of the Arkham Knight and how he's written, he still fucking sucks. For a man that claims so goddamn much about how he knows everything about Batman that he we knows know how, how he thinks. thinks, berating him with a hundred unarmed tanks is really the most intelligent move. That guy doesn't know you very well now, does he? I think you're trapped down here. <laughs> Villain thinks a bullet to the stomach and a handful of tanks will stop the Batman. It's Bat! And oh my god, is he so fucking whiny. I get that Jason Todd wasn't a likable character back in the 80s. That's why the audience killed him. But the Red Hood storyline makes him cool and interesting and we get none of that from this Arkham Knight. It's just constant crying about how much he hates Batman, how much he knows how he thinks, that he's old. Dear God, does this man love reminding Bruce how old he is? Must also be an MGK fan. Somebody grab some clippers, this fucking beard is weird. And then once the reveal happens, you spend the entire boss fight hearing him whining and crying until you punch him enough that he disappears for the rest of the story, the rest of the game even, until right at the very moment that Scarecrow's about to kill you, which is when he all of a sudden shows up and saves you. Yeah, there's the lead up to it with seeing the Red Hood logo outside of the building and this interaction between Bruce and Alfred. I'm detecting someone tracking your movement through the city. I knew he would. But it still just feels like it comes out of nowhere. For spending the entire game whining and crying about how much you hate Batman and how much you want to kill him, you should sure throw that plan away quickly and just team up with him again. It makes all of this meaningless, especially when replaying it. It's hard to take anything this man says seriously when I know he's just gonna be fine with me in the end because Batman says sorry. Same can be said for Deathstroke, but we'll get to him later. So the writing low-key sucks, but what about the gameplay? Well, for the most part, it's actually pretty good, especially with the combat. Arkham Knight easily has the best and most refined combat out of all games in the series. Being Batman has never felt more satisfying. From big things like new gadgets or environmental takedowns to smaller things like being able to just pinpoint on one goon and continue to beat him up even when he's on the ground until he's finished, which feels great every time and I miss that feature whenever I play any of the other previous games. Every combat or predator mission in this game is an absolute plus with how amazing this feels. You can consistently get great moments with the environmental takedowns allowing you to take out goons by dropping a lamp onto their head or throwing them into an electrical box. The fear multi-takedown being an absolute 
absolute beast, allowing you to take out multiple enemies in slow motion, wiping out an entire room and disappearing before anyone else shows up. Rocksteady somehow found out more ways to make you feel like Batman. Not to mention the introduction of the dual combat and takedown, allowing you to fight alongside with a member of the Bat Family, swapping between the two whenever you want, and at certain moments, take down an enemy using both characters, which is always a blast to do. It's one of the biggest highlights of the game for me. There's also the new gadgets that you get to play with, like the voice synthesizer, which is great in Predator missions, allowing you to rig up a weapons crate with the disruptor, then calling over a goon to get electrocuted by it. Or telling a goon to go check out a generator just to blow it up right in front of him using the remote hacking device, which you can also use to turn the militia drones onto the militia if you're able to. The disruptor even gets some of its own upgrades, allowing you to not only rig their weapons, but also their gear or their surroundings, and also a lot more versatile than both City and Origins counterparts. And Knight even fixed one of Origins' big problems with the Disruptor. Origins, for some reason, was programmed that the bullet, for lack of a better word, that would be shot at the enemy was a physical entity that if hit by anything else would stop said thing from being disrupted, but you would still lose out on a shot. Knight does the same thing, but makes it so you don't actually lose out on the shot unless it was properly hit. Such a simple thing. I don't know why it wasn't there to begin with. Not only is Batman upgraded, but the enemies are as well. Some of them can detect when you're in detective mode and find your location based on that, which is a lot better than just jamming it in my opinion. Some are medics, which revive fallen goons, making them the number one priority to take down immediately, or you can use the disruptor to make it so they get electrocuted when trying to revive someone. The titans are basically back, only they're just reskinned to be giant brutes, but in the end you still take them down in the same way. Though now they're able to come with blades and shields sometimes, and they're surprisingly the least annoying version of the Titans in this entire franchise. Especially with the help of the environmental takedowns, which you can try to avoid the stunning and beating down by getting a brute near an available takedown and bada bing bada boom one hit. Seriously, Arkham Knight's combat is damn near perfect and genuinely makes these missions enjoyable. Unfortunately, that's not where the game's combat ends. The Bat Tank. You see what that thing does to cars? I ain't staying to find out! I'm sure there's no need for an explanation of it at this point. It lives in infamy for either being the thing you absolutely love or fucking despise. And me, I despise this hunk of metal. I thought I was playing an Arkham game, not Forza Horizon Gotham mode. Oh wow, War of Tanks. Oh shit, Mario Kart. I get it, everyone wanted the Batmobile, so we're gonna get it at some point. And its entrance into the game is incredible. It's one of the most badass moments in the game and maybe even in the whole series. But oh my fucking god, did Rocksteady overuse the fuck out of this. And that's understandable. God knows how many lines of code and sleepless nights it took programming it, so of course you want to make it worth the time and effort. But holy shit, not only does this thing get relied on to hell and back through the story, but it also bleeds into side missions and even characters that have absolutely zero reason to have any involvement with the take whatsoever. So starting off, looking at just my playthrough of the story, which is a little finicky because the game just loves to cut off my footage whenever it feels like it, I have roughly 10 hours of me just playing through the main story, and including when the main story forces me to start some of the side quests. Roughly two and a half hours of it is spent in the Bat Tank, which, uh, yeah, when I say it out loud, it doesn't sound like much, but God does it feel like it with how often you're in it during the beginning and how much of the ending is spent being in it. And this isn't even counting the entire tank battle that happens after you get Barbara to the GCPD. There's like two big chunks of gameplay without the tank, but even then, that's got some tank moments between the two. And that's not even mentioning how you have to be in the bat tank every single fucking time you want to get in or out of the GCPD, which is fucking absurd. And honestly, just annoying having to call the tank and get in just to open the door, and then drive through the parking garage just to get to the entrance of the GCPD every single time. Why can't Batman have a secret entrance to the GCBD? There's one on the roof. Why can't I just use that? The cops are so reliant on Batman anyways. At the end of the story, they just forget their own existence and go, ah, we're fucked without Batman. Why do I gotta go through the normie route and have to get into the bat tank every fucking time? But we don't stop using the bat tank. There's also Armored and Dangerous, where you chase down tanks, and Campaign for Disarmament, where you get thrown into a tank battle while trying to stop a bomb. The missions aren't great, but the reasoning for the bat tank being used makes sense. But then you get into Gotham on Fire, where we get to meet up with Firefly 10 years after the last meetup in Arkham Origins, and while I guess you can do this, why? 
I gotta wonder if Rocksteady was forced to put in Firefly because this mission absolutely sucks. Remember in Origins when you got to do 2D parkour, switch perspectives, get cool ass shots, and then in the fight you had to dodge his attacks, attack him with the right opportunities, and then get to take a ride through the air? It was fun! It involved combat! It switched up the gameplay often! Okay, so in Night, you stop the fire so then Firefly burst out, says some fire pun, and then you chase him down. No, you don't get to do any attacking. These aren't the tank chases, which at the very least you were active in combat. Nah, you're just following him until he eventually runs out of fuel so you can knock him down and punch him a couple times. Do this a total of three times. I mean, seriously, if Firefly was really intended to be in this game from the start and not just because he was in Origins, if this was Rocksteady's creative vision for what their take on a Batman vs. Firefly boss fight is, then holy shit! Same goes for Deathstroke. You gotta get to the point in the story where you confront Jason and then also complete Armored and Dangerous, Campaign for Disarmament, and Occupy Gotham, where you spend the entire time hearing Slade talk about waiting for this rematch, how he's been honing in on his craft all these years, ready to kill Batman. And then he shows up in literally the fucking Cloudburst 2.0 and it's the exact fucking same boss fight. And here's the kicker, when destroying the tank, Slade comes launching out in this cool animation and Batman immediately just knocks him out and puts him in the bat tank. What the fuck?! If you were any kind of man, pull the car over and finish this properly. You were the one that chose to be in the tank! When the storyboard for a movie set in the Snyderverse that infamously does not understand the characters has a better fight scene between these two characters, you know you fucked up. How do you get outplayed by the cash grab? This is, no joke, the reason why I quit playing the game five years ago. I had finally finished all the militia missions, got the side mission to go meet up with Deathstroke, and the second I saw that it was just a reskin cloudburst, I quit. And the only time I ever played it again was when I got the DLC and needed gameplay for the Batman movies video. I can't find anywhere if Rocksteady was forced to add Firefly and Deathstroke because of Origin, so I am in no way saying that they were. I have no proof of that. But with how piss poor these fights are, I would not be surprised. But that's not even the fucking end of it, because we still have one more side mission that forces you to use the Bat Tank. Not only do you have to use the tank to unlock Riddler trophies, you also have to race. Yes, Riddler built giant underground racetracks underneath the city of Gotham so Batman can use his tank to do laps in a certain amount of time, and you can even control the traps at your own until the very last lap of the very last race. Look, I've already exhausted a lot of anger while playing these races, mostly because I hate races and am very bad at them. So, I just want to say, sorry Catwoman, you're unfortunately going to have to spend the rest of your life in here un unless you can figure out how to escape on your own because there is no goddamn way I'm finishing that last lap. No, seriously, I struggle so goddamn much on this lap. I know, I know, skill issue, but like, holy shit, I struggle a bit through the beginning, start to pick myself up, and then eat utter fucking shit at the final part and just keep dying over and over and over. Over. And the fade out doesn't stop the timer. It keeps fucking going, so I just lose time because I gotta watch the tank explode or drown and respawn. Not only that, when you fail the lap and gotta restart, you don't get summoned to the beginning. Nah, you still gotta finish the track. So I get to continue to suffer more and more just to try to restart the lap and then finally get past it and start. And thankfully, it just resets the lap, but lo and fucking behold, I continue to keep dying at the same spot. Detective, time waits for no man, and I wait for no bat. And I, I didn't even bother with the Riddler trophy since I guess the final boss fight with him is, is some shit with a mech suit. I don't even hate this game's Riddler as a character. It might even be my favorite conceptually. His Riddler moments are at its peak with him crying out to all of Gotham about how Batman won't do what he wants him to do. But not only does that get kind of annoying and in general I become aggravated with his cockiness, but the tank shit is so fucking stupid. Arkham Knight is so frustrating because it's really fun for most of its story. 
Yeah, the writing isn't the greatest, but ultimately it's down to the gameplay in order to make or break a game for me. Is the story fun to do? If so, you can find me replaying the game sometime in the future. If not, I don't touch the game for five straight years until I need to for a retrospective. Arkham Knight starts off as pretty entertaining to play through with the help of the advanced combat and just in general how the game controls and feels. It makes getting through a vast majority of the story pretty easily and I find myself getting lost in the world and the game and genuinely enjoying myself. Joker popping up randomly to mock Batman and make a bunch of dark fucked up comments probably helps. But then you get to the cloud burst and any sense of enjoyability falls off a fucking cliff and not only for this boss fight, but for the entire rest of the story. The Cloudburst is the bane of my goddamn existence, the mission I dreaded the most when returning to the game. An absolute hell. How many Cobra tanks are in the Cloudburst? I think there's five. How many Cobra tanks are during the Cloudburst mission? Night. Seven! There actually is. There's seven of them. Oh my god. I thought there was only five. <laughs> Not only is it entirely based in the fucking bat tank, meaning I get the fun controls of this unstable pile of junk, but also there's seven cobra tanks you have to take out before getting to the cloudburst itself. Sounds fair enough, except for most of the time when I get close enough to aim at a cobra, another one turns the corner and I gotta dip the fuck out as fast as possible so I don't waste all my health getting barotted with bullets in hopes I can take out one cobra. You also get the cloudburst itself roaming around with a full 360 degree view which makes it damn near impossible to do anything when it's around because it will just kill you. And that's not to mention the glorious commentary of the Arkham Knight that you're subjected to for the entirety of the fight. Batman, just stop! Stay and fight! It's over, Batman! Gotham's dead! Come out and face me, Batman, if you dare! Stop playing hard to get! Come and fight! I just want you dead! I'm gonna nag you! You can't run! The car's not strong enough! Neither are you! This tank was built to destroy you! So while I'm already getting pissed off at the mission itself and this stupid fucking tank, but I also gotta listen to this whiny cocky crybaby the entire time? Fun! Oh, and I have a question for Rocksteady. Did you think the Cloudburst mission was going to be easy? Was that the reason why there's only one death cutscene? You're finished, and Gotham's finished too. God, the amount of times I've had to hear that both times I've played through the story because the Cloudburst mission is fucking painful. I hate it. I hate everything about this mission. It's the worst part of the entire game without a fucking doubt in my mind. But okay, so what if this mission sucks? It's just one mission. How could this ruin the rest of the story? Because after this, you get one regular story section of roaming through Arkham Knight's base, defeating members of the militia, before being shoved into the tank again for not only excruciating tunnel chases where you can't make even the slightest of mistakes, or you're immediately dead with no way of recovering, which is great when the tank decides to just... but also several more excruciating tunnel chases and attempts to run the Arkham Knight into sets of bombs, where once again, one wrong move in the tunnels or the maze and you're dead. Oh, and don't get fooled by this euphoric moment because you soon get another fucking bat tank for the millionth battle with unarmed drones. It's just so much of the fucking tank and two immensely aggravating events using it that play so close to each other before the story quickly wraps up that makes any bit of overall enjoyment fucking plummet into the center of the earth when the Cloudburst shows up. It was this part of the story that made me realize why I've always preferred Origins overnight. Because Origins' story is fun from the very beginning to the very end. Yes, there's some stressful moments, mostly Bane's first and third boss fight, but the gameplay overall is simple and getting through the story is fun all throughout. It makes it easy to just pick up the game, play through the story, have fun, and then just put the game away. Knight, on the other hand, it flops back and forth between enjoyable Arkham game and Tank Simulator before crashing down in a fire of agony towards the end that it impacts my entire viewpoint of the story, making me never want to pick up this game again because I not only dread getting to that point, but I spent five years thinking the entire story was this painful. That's the lasting impression this game makes on me. Not its wonderful combat or any bit of good writing or 
actual genuine enjoyment from the story. Nah, the lasting impression it made on me was this god-awful tank, these god-awful missions, and PAIN! Other than the Cloudburst, the only other boss fights in the story is Harley and the Three Jokers and Jason's. Oh, and I guess there's the drone fight, but that's just every other tank battle. Starting off with Harley and the Three Jokers, Harley broke free the Three Joker patients, Christina Bell, Johnny Charisma, and Albert King, because she's still in love with the Joker, and this is the closest thing she's got. Getting to Christina involves going through a dual Predator mission with Robin, which is honestly pretty fun. I love the dual combat, so of course I'm gonna love it when it's implemented into the thing I love the most about these games. I mean, come on, getting to call the other person for a takedown is dope as fuck. After getting through Harley's goons, it's just a cutscene takedown. Well... At least it's supposed to be, but I guess I got distracted because I ended up getting Amber herded before finally taking her down. Which I'll give the game this, it results in different dialogue. What's she got against me? I'm practically your prisoner too. Let's get her back in the cell. I think she clawed half my face off. Be honest, how's it look? Like you're too slow. Next up is Johnny Charisma, where Batman gets to stand there listening to Joker sing a little song, while you control Robin sneaking around the room disarming the bombs while making sure you're not caught. After disarming all the bombs, I enacted the takedown in a panic, sadly cutting off the Joker's song. It's... alright. I like the song, what with its occasional dark lyric. Your parents are dead! And I can't stop laughing. As well as the part where you have to decipher the code, and if you can't, Batman just eventually breaks it in normal Batman fashion. Ugh, typical. I mean, why apply cognitive resources to a problem when you can just throw crap at it? Lastly, we have Albert King, which is just the typical dual combat where I just fought every other goon in the room until they gave me the dual team takedown option and enacted that onto Albert. You also get these fun moments where you and Robin tag team and just beat the absolute shit out of him, which will never not be fun to do in these games. You can carry him. Jeez, Bruce, no wonder everyone keeps leaving you. When you finally get to fight Harley, it's just an immediate dual takedown right at the beginning and then fighting off the rest of her goons. You know, now I'm actually looking forward to Suicide Squad kill the Justice League just to see if they let Harley do fucking anything. And the final boss fight in the story is Jason Todd, where my Xbox decided to just cut out all the footage for the fight. It's not like I reached an hour and it stopped recording beforehand. No, 12 minutes into the file is when I start to release Gordon and then just a jarring hard cut to Bruce and Barbara getting shot at by a bunch of tanks. Though I guess this is an issue for just consoles because I was obviously able to record Jason's fight on PC and I noticed in someone's gameplay for the Nightfall Protocol the PlayStation notification saying it was cutting off recording due to a locked section. So the reveal of Arkham Knight, the ending of the game, and the Nightfall Protocol are all locked off from recording on consoles? That makes sense given spoilers, but also it's been eight years since the game came out. Why the hell are these still locked? Anyways, Jason's boss fight is somewhat of a predator mission, at least in the case of the militia that he sends out through the room. When it comes to Jason himself, you just have to sneak your way underneath the gargoyles that he's perched on and take him by surprise. Do this three times and then Jason's defeated and decides not to want to kill Batman anymore. It's alright, I guess. I don't really know what to say about it. It's a predator mission with a dude on a gargoyle that won't stop crying. Won't be quick, Batman. You will suffer. It ends for you, Dark Knight, right here. It's your fault Joker got to me. Do you even know what Joker did to me? The games he used to play? This is mercy compared to what he put me through. Joker made me hate you, but you let him do it. I'm not your sidekick anymore. I grew up! He ruined me to spite you! You're no hero, no savior, you failed me, and now you're gonna fail Gotham the same way. You're not a legend to me. I say he dies right here! I learned how to take a little pain, Batman. I learned from the best. You can still hear him laughing. He's still in my head! I could also go on about how this feels lackluster when you think about how this is Batman versus Jason. Batman versus his own protege, and it's just a typical Predator mission with the most that happens between the two is Bruce attacking from under, while in other media they actually have hand-to-hand -hand combat testing the skills between the two. But it's obvious that Bruce in the Arkhamverse doesn't want to hurt Jason, and also, this is a Jason that sends unmanned drones to the man who doesn't kill, so it doesn't really surprise me he would just stand on a gargoyle and never learn to look down. I will say, I love how Gordon, while tied up, just sits there and mocks the militia while being Batman's hype man. <laughs> we got even more side missions than any of the other games in this franchise, and I honestly think aside from some being flat out bad, 
they're all just aggressively mid. I've already talked about Gotham on fire, so no need talking about it again. Occupy Gotham, Armored and Dangerous, Campaign for Disarmament, and Own the Roads are all based around the militia and taking them down just to end with the disappointing Deathstroke fight. They give off Radiant Quest vibes, but with an actual ending to them, which is nice. It's not a good ending by any means, but I'll take it over. Sir, another watchtower needs your help. I'll mark it on your map. <laughs> And I've also pretty much said most of what Riddler's Revenge is about. He's kidnapped Catwoman and put a bomb collar around her neck with the only way to take it off is to get the nine separate keys needed. So you gotta either solve an actual puzzle or do a stupid fucking race in order to unlock a key and sometimes a room in the orphanage. I forgot to mention Catwoman stuck in an abandoned orphanage where you do get some admittedly pretty fun sections. Switching between Bruce and Selina in order to solve puzzles and occasionally take down armies of Riddler robots. While the rest of it is the typical flying riddles and get Riddler trophies. And like I said, I never finished it because of this fucking track. So I got no opinion on the final room or Riddler's final boss fight other than that looks stupid. I don't need to waste my time to get this. And with all that out of the way, now it's time to talk about the other side missions. Friend in Need starts off as a simple gotta go save Lucius Fox before quickly becoming the anticipated follow up to identity theft. Arkham Knight's frustration continues with the beginning of this being kinda cool. Having you control Hush and walk into Bruce's office of Wayne Tower and attack Lucius in order to get into the computer. But then that's where it ends, cause the rest of this is just standing there listening to dialogue before Bruce reveals his identity, you hit Y to counter, and then you're done. Six murders, a surgery, and a year of recovery just to walk past a receptionist. Not nah, for real though, all this does is give an incredibly disappointing ending to identity theft. That mission built up all this anticipation, all this mystery to then give us a reveal while at the same time a loss. Now making us question, why has Thomas done this? What is his plan now? Eh, it turns out he just wants to take all of Bruce's money because... Because he killed his own parents? And Thomas saved his mother? And Bruce was given his riches and somehow those riches is something that Thomas believes is rightfully his? I am genuinely so fucking confused. Am I missing something here? Is there a line of dialogue I'm somehow skipping over? All I'm able to understand from this is that Thomas caused a car crash in an attempt to kill his own parents. Thomas Wayne was able to save his mother's life, and because of that, Thomas then, years after Thomas dies, Bruce becomes an adult and spends about 11 years being Batman, decides to kill six people and perform face surgery on himself to become an identical lookalike to Bruce Wayne just to get Bruce Wayne's money? I'm sorry, but that has got to be the dumbest fucking plan I've ever heard. What an absolute disappointment of an ending. Lamb to the slaughter sees Jack Ryder being the usual dumbass he is and getting himself trapped by Deacon Blackfire at the Lady of Liberty. So you go there, knock out a couple goons while being timed, enact a takedown on Deacon, and then you're done. Plain and simple, nothing mission that begs the question of, was this really necessary? And while it's an absolute nothing of a side quest, I put it above Friend in Need because at least it doesn't have a really good story with the cliffhanger, a four year wait time, and a disappointing ending. The Line of Duty, similarly to all the militia missions, gives off Radiant Quest vibes with 15 firefighters gone missing and occasionally get info on a location of one or maybe even find one on your own. Each event is the same with you having to take down all the surrounding goons, free the firefighters, have a bit of dialogue that slowly progresses through the story of finding out who's the culprit of these random fires that appear a few weeks after government cutbacks and a lot of the men being laid off. Given that Gotham on fire is a mission, your first assumption is that, of course, Firefly is responsible for all these fires and Technically, that is true. He is the one that causes the fires, but he's not the reason why they started. It turns out that instead, it was the chief himself that helped Firefly and gave him the locations and access to abandoned buildings, letting him light the place on fire and giving the firefighters jobs. Why is it even in Gotham firefighters end up being better than police? Nah, for real, I have no opinion on the twist itself as in whether or not it's good. Like I've repeated over and over again, I haven't touched this game in five years, so I can't remember how I initially felt when getting to this point. And when it comes to this playthrough, for a short amount of time, I was on the train of it's probably Firefly responsible until somewhere along the way it clicked and I was like, Oh yeah, isn't the chief responsible? I think a part of that click was how fucking often the chief is brought up. Like every other firefighter you save mentions something about how great the chief is that it starts to become kind of insanely apparent that, hmm, maybe the chief was responsible in something. It's kind of like another twist. Oh, what was it? It's escaping my mind right now, but oh well. I will say, 
I do kind of like this. The idea of the chief firefighter breaking the law and causing fires just so his team could stay employed is very Gotham to me, and I kind of sympathize with him. He even specifically targeted abandoned buildings so no one would get hurt. I mean, except for the firefighters themselves, but that just comes with the job. You could even take the same premise but make it so the chief becomes fully evil, and that would still work as a pretty good Batman story. As a side mission though, meh. The Radiant Lake energy brings it down, but at least it has a better plotline and ending than the militia shit. I cannot stress enough how much I hate how Deathstruck was treated in this game. Two-Face Bandit has Two-Face sending his men to rob three different banks and you have to put a stop to them. The gameplay is a bit unique with each of them being a Predator mission, but at the beginning it's timed with how much money the goons have been able to steal, and with the help of the alarms going off there's no need to be quiet. So go ahead and use as many knockout smashes as you want without the risk of getting caught. Eventually, once you've stopped enough money from getting stolen and the goons are well aware that you're in the building, you have to go back to using the typical Predator mission tactics until wiping out every goon in the building. By the third bank, Two-Face himself will show up, kicking out his goons in replacement for the militia. Now, does this lead into a Two-Face boss fight? Nah, Harvey was the first person I took out and I did that with an inverted takedown. How embarrassing. Hair to the Cow continues on the story from Watcher in the Wings, with Azrael appearing every now and then, lighting a burning bat symbol in order to catch Batman's attention. Here you get to swap to him and run a simulation fight in order to prove Azrael's worth of taking up the mantle after Bruce. The simulations are alright. I had some difficulty here and there, but it's not the first or the last time this game will be rage-inducing. After the fourth test, Alfred gives you the identity of Asriel, and it's off to the clock tower to do a bit of research. It's here that you get to find out that the Order of Saint Dumas planted markers and altered Asriel's memory, basically brainwashing him into thinking his only purpose is to kill Batman. And with that reveal, you're given control of Asriel once again and three choices. Turn around and leave, break the sword and leave, or actually attempt to kill Batman. First of all, I had no idea there was a third choice. I only knew of the break the sword or kill Batman. It wasn't until writing the script and looking through Batman Arkham videos footage that I found out. And before you ask, why are you looking at someone else's footage? Listen, I have 22 hours of footage and I can't find the Asriel part right now and it's just easier to do this anyways. Leaving the clock tower and breaking the sword gives you the same outcome, with the two dapping it up after Asriel heads off to enact vengeance on the Order. Attempting to kill Batman obviously doesn't go over very well, with Azrael getting knocked unconscious and brought to the GCPD, locking him up and getting the typical Joker comment. If you've seen my Oblivion vs Skyrim video, you know I love when games give you different choices, and that's not something the Arkham games ever really did. And if you haven't seen it, please go watch it. That was over a year in the making, and I would very much appreciate it. But yeah, getting to make a choice like this in an Arkham game is honestly pretty cool, and since my first playthrough I tried to kill Batman, I decided for this I'd break the sword and let Azrael go off and get vengeance. And while I get that it would make the canon to see complicated if there was a DLC where you got to play through that vengeance if you had decided to try to kill Batman, I think it would have at least been cool to experience something like that. Hell, it doesn't even have to be a DLC. It could have been like a little bonus section that appears in the menu, but only if you went that route. I don't see anything stopping that since it's a fucking video game. If Metal Gear Solid 3 could make the ghosts of specifically the NPCs you kill appear during the story back in 2004, you could have a bonus mission pop up in the Arkham episodes menu after taking this round in 2015, but I digress. It's a decent side mission, mostly because of the build-up to its typical fight goon shit, but the ending is at least interesting, and again, giving you that multiple choice for the first time in the whole series is cool. Gunrunner involves the Penguin once again having weapon caches, where the hell have I heard this before? But this time, instead of stealing them, he's the one selling the weapons to anybody who wants one and attempt to take out Batman. The cool thing about this mission, though, is that you're joined by Nightwing given how he's been tracking the Penguin the entire time. Hell, the whole reason why Penguin has all these weapons is because he's smuggling them out of Bloodhaven. Now, yes, there are moments leading up to them where you have to follow a van to the location, that's... whatever. I don't hate them, but I don't love them. They're alright. It's just the parts where you get to the hideouts and get to take down the goons with Nightwing that's a lot of fun for me. Nightwing sits out the fourth fight, which causes him to get kidnapped and you having to rescue him, just so he can get held at gunpoint again when you have your back turned. Jeez, dick, you've been doing this for how many years and Cobblepot of all people brings you to your knees? No wonder Batman never gives you praise. I'm proud of you, dick.
Okay, thanks, Bruce. Again, it's another one of those Radiant Quest vibes, but the fact that it allows you to play more of the dual combat is enough for me to like it. Creature of the Night is the introduction to Man Bat in this universe, and you have no idea how happy that made me. Thanks to the LEGO game, Man Bat is one of my favorite villains in the Batman's Rogues Gallery. Not because he's mentally fucked up like Zaz, or Chaos Incarnate like the Joker, or a sad case like Mr. Freeze, but because he's so fucking stupid and I love it. The man genetically spliced his blood with bat blood, turning him into a giant bat. And not even for any needing a cure for a deadly disease reasons like Morbius, just because he wanted humans to have the sonic ability of a bat. Just for science. Science isn't about why, it's about why not. When is Warner Brothers gonna make a man bat movie? James Gunn, please. And could you also add Killer Moth, that lovable dork? Anyways, the mission starts when you randomly encounter Man Bat flying through the streets of Gotham. After running into him for the first time, tackling him down to the ground and taking his blood before he flies away, Alfred's able to use that blood to find the identity of Kirk Langstrom and a last known location. Arriving there, you find a laboratory and wreckage and a video on repeat of Langstrom and his wife having an adorable interaction as he explains the science, then cut to Spider-Man 2002 and now Langstrom's wife is dead and he's flying around Gotham as a giant bat. You create an antidote, which took me way too long to do because I still have no idea what the hell you're supposed to do here. I just frantically moved joysticks while desperately trying to build up the percentage, and then it's off to go inject him with it. It takes two separate attempts to do so, but he regresses back into his human form, where you put him in the Batmobile and take him off to GCPD, where he gets to be held in his own special cage instead of in the main big one where everyone else is being held in. And what comes with the Man Bat Quest is... <laughs> I'm just now realizing there was a severe lack of jump scares and Origins. <laughs> Later on, if you go back to the laboratory, you can find that Kirk's wife is gone and a message is written on the now moved TV. And if you decide to play this game on Halloween or switch your console time, which I'm unable to do because for some reason Microsoft still renders me as a child despite me clearly being of age and also I'm on a console I bought with my own money, then you get another man bad jump scare and return to the GCPD, you could find that Kirk is broken out of his cell. Honestly, while nothing much happens, I still enjoy it a lot just on the basis that it's centered around Man Bat. And the final base game side mission we have is the perfect crime. Shut the fuck up, Discord. Who messaged me? Who messaged me? Fuck you, John. <laughs> and Shut up! Oh my god, I'm gonna scream. <laughs> Scattered through Gotham are dead bodies strung up and opera music playing. At each body, you get to play with Rocksteady's expansion to detective mode that I mentioned earlier in the origin section, allowing you to switch between the different layers of the body to scan for evidence, piecing everything together to figure out who the victim is. After enough victims, Bruce and Alfred are able to figure out the connection between all the victims with the Circus of Strange, ran by Laszlo Valentin. Finding a beauty salon that Laszlo used to leave, so obviously that's where he's at. Pig's boss fight consists of beating up his Dolotrons until he eventually comes down to throw an infinite amount of butcher knives at you. Countering the throws makes you throw one back at him, but I'm not entirely sure if that's necessary for taking him out because by the time I was able to get the enact environmental takedown to pop up again, he was back to being normal and I was just able to take him down. You free the hostages and then take Pig back to the GCPD. I'm gonna be honest, I feel bad for everyone in this cell. No crime is worth being locked up next to this creep constantly singing opera. Y'all are lucky I gave up on the Riddler. The perfect crime is, I guess, my favorite side mission in Night, mostly because it was my introduction to Pig and... I'm an I can fix him girl, aren't I? It's also the voice actor that makes the character for me and Dwight Schultz nails this performance. Speaking of the perfect crime, this quest is the reason why his ass side mission got scrapped due to the two being very similar. Look, I can understand the decision of wanting to go for the new character over the old, but now I'm just sad that I didn't get to see my boy aside from one quick cameo. Overall, the best way I can describe my feelings on Arkham Knight is that it's frustrating. There's a lot of things that I like about the game, and that's surprising to me given how I completely wrote it off. I love the combat, especially the dual combat system. I love the Joker popping up to make comments about the story or even the villains you lock away. I love the interactions with the Bat family, including Catwoman. I love the beauty of this Gotham City. It doesn't feel dead like in Origins, even with like six million people being evacuated. All the attention to detail put into the world building, even being able to see Asylum and City in the background. They even kept Ivy's vines! 
I don't know why, but I love that so much. Using Scarecrow's fear gas to bring trippiness into the game, having it so the movement of the camera angle changes what's on screen is so fucking cool to me. Moments during the story, like when Batman has to lock himself away and how every time you do so, Joker will come along and free you while making a different comment each time. Even something as small as the grapnel boost having up to five upgrades to it, allowing you to be able to just soar forever feels so amazing. Hell, even the beginning of the game is pretty cool, with you getting to be in a POV and control the cop in the diner before it gets taken over with fear gas. And even just for a split second getting to play COD Zombies and kill the innocent. <laughs> I also like the main theme, to be honest. Something about the pumping bass and the low-key vibe of it in comparison to the other more bombastic themes just works for me. Not only as a Batman theme or even just a song, but also a theme to the character towards his end. And I will say, I think that this game has my favorite thug dialogue. I'm telling you, we should split. What happens if the bat decides to break all our limbs? In case you forgot, we just trashed the emergency room. If Batman is Bruce Wayne, then who's been playing Bruce Wayne all this time? You don't scare me. This is our city. We get to terrorize it. No one else. You know, I kind of thought of Batman as a force of nature. This whole Wayne thing ruins it for me. And now I've seen a couple of prison rides in my time, but this is way better. Dead bodies, tanks, mass evacuations, I love Gotham at night. Trust me, don't hit the banks. They're spoken for. Ivy saved Gotham? <laughs> Sell out. You know, I was one of Scarecrow's patients back at the asylum. I'm glad the bat got him. What's with all the rain? Suddenly Penguin don't look so stupid with that umbrella. Remember, if you see Batman, shout and charge him. Never fails. Poor Batman. He's lost all his, uh... What do you call it? Uh, mistake. First Arkham Asylum, then Arkham City, now this Arkham Knight. What's next? But I hate the Bat Tank, I hate the Arkham Knight, I hate the Cloudburst, I hate the Deathstroke fight, I hate the Riddler races, I hate how bogged down the side missions are, and this is just a small thing, but I absolutely hate that they swapped left trigger from detective mode to call the Batmobile. It's like this game wants to shove me in the bat tank at every turn. I get so used to the controls of the previous three games, load this one up and want to be in detective mode, and now I'm in the fucking bat tank again, thank you! And I get what Rocksteady was trying to do with the story of the game, have this underlying theme of loss. Jason returning, Barbara getting kidnapped, which leads to Gordon leaving Batman, Dick getting captured by the Penguin, Catwoman getting captured by the Riddler, and Scarecrow attempting to make Gotham lose hope in Batman. But I think the writing overall is really messy. Scarecrow wants to fill the entirety of Gotham with his fear gas, but lets the innocent leave first, so then only the criminals get dosed. But what he wants from the innocent is losing hope in Batman. Then what was the point of the fear gas? Arkham Knight wants to kill Batman, but doesn't during any possible chance he can, and sends unmanned drones to the man who doesn't kill, and just immediately is fine with Bruce at the end of the story. And even the whole everything Joker says is just what Batman's thinking gets a little iffy at times. Like, take for example this interaction. Oh, come on. You think you're different because you never killed anyone? Newsflash! You killed me! I was there, remember? You destroyed my cure right in front of me. <laughs> Watch me choke on my last laugh. And then, after killing me, you said you would have shared. <laughs> you couldn't admit I'd won, could you? Not even as a parting gift. In a way, I can see Batman thinking this, given how he blames himself whenever something bad happens, even throughout this series. But at the same time, Batman does know that it's not his fault, right? Like, he does know that Joker is responsible for his own death. That if Joker hadn't been selfish and stabbed Batman, causing the cure to fall onto the floor, that he'd be cured. Because I can 100% believe Joker himself thinking this way. No way in hell is Joker going to take responsibility for his own actions and just going to blame Batman for his own death. That I totally get. I could totally see that. But... I'm supposed to believe that whatever Joker's saying isn't actually coming from the Joker. It's the toxic blood turning Batman into the Joker that's taking Batman's thoughts and translating them through the Joker, which tells me that this is what Batman thinks. 
Did it take nine months for Batman to forget that he was stabbed? That the Joker did this to himself? That there was nothing in that moment that he could have possibly done? Again, I can totally believe every word that Joker's saying if that was his thoughts, but you're trying to tell me that these are Batmans. That's confusing, to say the least. I'm not trying to insinuate anything, I'm just saying it's a bit of a coincidence that the writing in the Rock City games falls off pretty heavily when Paul Dini isn't there. Anyways... There's so much about this game to like, and there's so much I do like about it, but I hate so many things about it, and it ends up leaving a bad impression on me with its story. I have zero want to replay this unless I have to for videos, and even then, there were times while making this video that I chose to do other things over playing the game. And I will probably never touch this game after this video's finished unless I really need gameplay. Because I got 22 hours worth of it and I'm not afraid to reuse gameplay. I've been using the same three recordings of Cyberpunk. If you asked me before I replayed this game where I would put in my scoring, I don't know what number I would have given because I didn't have send it off to Denmark yet. But everyone that would listen to me talk about the Arkham games would know that I hated this game. But after replaying it, I can't say that I hate it. I hate a lot of things about it, but I can't deny that there are things I like about it. But just because I can attempt to walk out the diner at the beginning of the game doesn't make the cloud burst any less rage inducing. Just because the combat is fun doesn't make the side missions and boss fights any less shit. Just because there's some trippy visuals doesn't make the Arkham Knight any less unbearable. Just because there's so much attention to detail in the background that is genuinely amazing to see and point out doesn't make the bat tank any less fucking annoying. I don't hate the game, but the bat outweighs the good for me, and overall, I just don't like it. Yikes. <laughs> Yikes. Yikes Stadium. <laughs> Arkham Knight has the most DLCs out of all the games, with a ton of skins, challenge maps, and because of the bat tank, race tracks. Of course, we're gonna look at none of those and instead focus on these story-based DLCs, to which we have six that are deemed as Arkham episodes and one DLC that includes four new side missions. Unlike boss fights or side missions, I'm not gonna sort these in a ranking of least favorite to favorite, and instead just gonna go by release date. So with that being said, the first Arkham episode released was the Harley Quinn Story Pack, which I think was also my first Arkham Knight DLC I played because the copy of the game I had came with it, but my friend had already used the code before I got his copy, and I guess I decided to just buy that DLC because it was cheap instead of getting the season pass, which I eventually got years later. <laughs> the episode plays out before the events of Arkham Knight, while Scarecrow's getting the rogues gallery together in order to kill Batman, bringing on Harley to break out Poison Ivy of the Bloodhaven Police Department, and you get to play as Harley. Just like with every other playable character, Harley gets her own unique set of gadgets and even her own version of detective mode. Harley's gadgets include Snare Trap, Laughing Gas, and Jack in the Box. The Snare Trap and Laughing Gas seem to do similar things, basically stopping the enemy in its tracks. The Snare Trap does it by trapping the enemy in place, and the Laughing Gas by making them laugh so hard they can't move. The Jack in the Box is Harley's special version of the Exploding Gel, though it makes noise, allowing enemies to walk up to and exploding them once detonating. Her gameplay is also a bit different. Instead of Detective Mode, we have Psychosis Mode, which pretty much does the same thing, showing where enemies are and how much of them are left, but the design is vastly different. Instead of the nice blues that we're used to, you get a similar red as with Catwoman, only a lot sharper, and every inch of the walls are scrambled manic writing, giving us a peek inside of Harley's brain. And while you're in psychosis mode, you can occasionally hear conversations between Harleen and Harley, which I always love a good convo between the two, and some of these interactions are really funny. Think this over. Harley, listen to reason. Harley, shut up! He's dead, Harley. Dead. Dead, dead, dead. Dead. Stay dead. One more time, and I'm getting a lobotomy. You hear me, Harley? A lobotomy! There is no such thing as a silent takedown, because as Harley puts it, so every takedown is loud and alerts enemies. So the natural swap of what would be a fear takedown, we get mayhem mode, allowing every hit to be a takedown. I also love Harley's combat animation, showing off her acrobatic skills as well as the many uses of her trusty bat. The story really isn't much. Harley is breaking Ivy out of Bloodhaven, so fight off cops, blow up cops, pick off cops, fight off cops, pick off cops, fight off cops, fight Nightwing, 
free ivy, the end. This already shows that this DLC is better than the main game because you can harm cops. <laughs> Same reason for Origins. <laughs> For real though, I like everything leading up to the Nightwing fight, especially the second Predator mission where you get to play with Ivy's man-eating plants. And of course, I like Harley Quinn. I like Tara Strong. Getting to play as Harley and hear more Tara is always gonna be a joy, especially with some fun dialogue moments. It's like Joker always said, if it ain't complicated, it ain't fun. Right, well, I don't even know how to respond to that. I know, he was so profound. But I'm just gonna say it, I hate the Nightwing fight, and yes, that is 100% because of skill issue. I just hate the onslaught of cops and how often I end up hitting them instead of Nightwing, or vice versa, only worse because hitting Nightwing straight on causes damage. Somehow, when doing this for this video, I managed to finish the fight in one go, though I was somewhat low on health. I remember the first time doing this, though, and dying so fucking often, and just barely winning. Like, one more hit and I would have been dead. That's pretty much everything when it comes to this DLC. Overall, I think it's alright. The combat is fun, boss fight isn't, and is very short, leaving little replay value to it. I totally get loving this DLC if you're a massive Harley Quinn fan, though. And I will say, because of the fact that you get to play as her, meaning she actually does shit, I like it more than Harley Quinn's Revenge. Though I wish we could have gotten a morning Harley skin at night, but whatever. I like it for the most part. I just don't like the Nightwing fight and how short it is. Oh boy, yeah. The Red Hood story pack, on the other hand. All right, let's get this out of the way. I guess there really is a difference between Arkham Knight and Red Hood because Jason's a lot better in this. He's no longer annoying, and while his dialogue's not great, it's a lot better than constant bitching. I mean, he's got one cool response. You ain't gonna kill me. You ain't gonna kill me. Do I look like Batman to you? Not as good as this one, though. You wanna die? There's easier ways to kill yourself. Yeah, like yelling at the guy who's holding the AK-47. But I digress. And I like playing as him. Batman-esque gameplay, but you get to shoot things and not as Batman. I like it. With that being said, though, I think the shooting sucks. You can either press left trigger, to which Red Hood will stand there and shoot a random enemy a few times, but then also get hit at the same time because you can't counter while shooting, or you can hold down left trigger and go into first person mode, but the shooting doesn't change. So one tap of the right trigger and Red Hood shoots three bullets out of both guns, which is just weird. I can't be the only one that thinks that's a weird mechanic for FPS style gameplay, right? And the first person shooting feels very clunky. Like, I'm never given the choice to shoot, it's all based on when the game allows me to. The shooting works great from afar, pretty much making the dual handguns only good during the Predator mission, which is kinda disappointing to me. Gotta say, I think Gotham Knights does Red Hood shooting a lot better. The rest of this is just... eh. Combat map, Predator mission, combat map, Black Mask fight. And I spent majority of the DLC on the Predator mission. But hey, Black Mask is the actual villain of the DLC. Say out a joker. <laughs> and his boss fight is pretty much the same as Nightwing's, only without taking damage anytime you directly punch him. And also, I feel like Harley does more damage towards Nightwing than Red Hood does Black Mask, even when using guns. What the fuck is Black Mask wearing that Nightwing isn't? Holy shit. And when I think about it, I guess I like Nightwing's fight more, because there's just more gameplay to be had. Yeah, it's annoying having to always jump over him, but it's at least something compared to three minutes of non-stop punching. Overall, while I like that you get to play as Red Hood and he's a lot better than the Arkham Knight, I still don't really think this DLC is all that worth it aside from my first playthrough. And even though it's two dollars, I'd honestly rather spend that on the Harley Quinn DLC and just try to get this for free if possible. Yikes. <laughs> Yikes. Yikes Stadium. <laughs> so I've always known that A Matter of Family was made by WB Montreal, and I think that's funny because it's the best Arkham episode in my opinion, but I just found out while working on this video that they also made the Harley Quinn and Red Hood story packs. I guess they can't all be went wait a fucking minute. I literally wrote that line as, ooh, another thing that WB Montreal did better than Rocksteady, but no, that was an improvement. Damn. Anyways, A Matter of Family takes place before Arkham Asylum with Joker kidnapping Commissioner Gordon, and with the threat of killing him if Batman shows up, Batgirl is off to save her dad with a bit of help from Tim Drake. Throughout most of the DLC, you play as Batgirl roaming through the amusement park searching for the Joker. 
Batgirl's gameplay is similar to any other member of the Bat family. You have the Batarang, Batclaw, Explosive Gel, Line Launcher, and Remote Hacking Device. That last one being a bit more important than the others, since there's a decent amount of sections requiring you to use it. According to Justin Vaquez, the design producer on Matter of Family, Hacking is really what separates her from the other characters. Our intention was that Batgirl should be less powerful than Batman, but that Batgirl plus hacking could give her opportunities to do things that not even Batman can pull off. It's a gameplay mechanic with which the player can create situations for Batgirl to really shine. Top that off with Batgirl's combat animations being full of a lot of kicks, and there you have another example of WB Montreal knowing Batman characters and how to make good use of them. I honestly really love the sections where Batgirl is obviously outmatched, but because of her skill at hacking, she can use the darkness to her advantage. Batman would be proud. So like I said before, I think this is the best Arkham episode out of the six. First reason being that it actually feels worth playing. It has enough content and runtime for it to feel like a somewhat proper DLC. Not only does the amusement park lend itself to a more open world field than the last two DLCs, but there's actually somewhat of a story going on, many more events happening, and even secret lore. Unlike the last two, pretty much just trading between combat maps and predator missions and then ending after like 10-20 minutes, Matter of Family has seven combat sections, three predator missions, and in between each one is an actual event like stopping the three bombs that Robin's found or saving cops. Even something like grappling across the drag lifts helps make this DLC feel a lot bigger. There's also just so many great dialogue moments, like Harley knowing the exact reason why Batman only works in the context of America. Or the really funny interaction between the Joker thugs and the hostage during the Kraken Predator mission. Or even just... whatever the fuck this convo I overheard was. I need to take a day tomorrow. For what? I got a part as dumb soldier in a video game. Listen to this. Take it cover! Get cover! I need cover! Need to find cover! Good stuff. You, uh, really got into character. Apparently people don't like Tim Drake being in this and the Tim Barber relationship in the Arkhamverse as a whole. Honestly, I don't really care. Personally, I'm more of a dick and barber person, but it's at least better than Bruce and Barbara. Ugh. My only problem is that some of the dialogue between the two is a bit clunky. Barb? Yeah? Never mind. Don't do that. It can wait. You sure? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's nothing. It, it can wait. Watch yourself out there. Ditto. I think I may have picked up a trail of laughing gas. The Joker? Could be. Let me know what you find. Will do. Or how often Tim goes to do something just for Barbara to immediately go, no, but that's about it. They do have some cute moments in here. Don't worry, Barb. You got this. It's gonna be all right. How can you be so sure? <laughs> Well, for one, Robin's a good luck. I don't know. That lady. Good work. Yeah, 200 years ago. I concur, my lady. Do you? I do. Thought you said Robin's were good luck. He missed, didn't he? But I think they're a lot better in Tim's DLC. I'll make him talk. Really? What? Nothing. Barbara, I know when you want to say something. Okay, it's just... You were always the good cop. Aren't you? Good cop, huh? Okay. Not bad, huh? Very scary, honey. The boss fight in this is also pretty fun, with not only having the dual combat with Robin, but also Joker and Harley. Finally, Harley does something! Not for real, while writing the script was when it dawned on me that this is the first time in the entire franchise that we've had a Harley boss fight where you actually get to fight Harley. So once again, more things that WB Montreal does better than Rocksteady. What the hell happened to Gotham Knights? But I think the big factor of why I love this DLC so much is because of the Starro Easter egg. You see, if you go to the ship and then behind the Fire Eater sign, you can find a small walled off area that has a vent. Breaking into said vent and going through puts you into a room that has two glass tanks, one holding a starfish with a never blinking eye. A bit small, but yeah, that looks like Starro. What the fuck? But hey, uh, let's use photo mode to try to clip into the tank. Yeah, uh, did you know about this? 
because I knew about the Star Wars Easter egg and thought it was just the eye in the back, but when I revisited it for this video, I noticed it when I went to the side of the tank. Decided to use photo mode to try to get a better view and accidentally no clipped, genuinely got jump scared. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, this shit is terrifying. If you don't know who Starro is, a quick recap is that he's a mind-controlling starfish that several times has controlled the Justice League. So why in the absolute goddamn fuck is he held in a glass tank within an amusement park built for a five-year-old daughter? This is genuinely the most terrifying shit in this entire franchise. Nothing stands up to it. You can put jump scares all over the place, anxiety-ridden levels, haunting singing. Me in a thong? You could even give me that, and it won't amount to this goddamn thing. Even just thinking about it creeps me out. It, it's already so fucking gross looking because of course it's a sea creature, they're all gross, but then you realize that they're keeping a world killing starfish hidden in an amusement park built by a guy who made the park for his ill-ridden daughter who Joker later OD'd on Titan and then got the guy to off himself. And apparently he's there because he was gonna be a sideshow act? Ah, yes, come on down, children, and watch the fun mind-controlling starfish! Now, remember when I said that this DLC gives us some lore? Yeah, throughout the park, you can find these little speakers, which slowly tell us that story of the guy building the amusement park, talking directly to his daughter that he's building the park for. Joker using his alias of Jack White to convince the man to build the park based on the drawings that the daughter made while in the hospital, and the guy being trusting of all this because of Harley, who he only knows as Dr. Harleen Quinzel. The recordings seem to be somewhat wholesome until eventually it starts being revealed that the daughter's being tested with the Titan formula, only being on board because he thinks that it'll actually cure it, but it doesn't. She ends up overdosing on the Titan around the time that the part was finished, which then leads him into a deep depression that Joker takes advantage of by making him overdose as well and taking the park all to himself. Now that's incredibly fucking dark, probably the darkest shit in this entire franchise, but I think what adds a whole other level of fucked up is how this story ends up reshaping the viewpoint on one of the characters you're introduced way back in Asylum. Because guess who was the one giving the daughter Titan and tripling the dosage causing her to die? Dr. Penelope Young. Now, I don't know about you, but I've always seen Young as another one of Joker's victims. Someone who was tricked into his plan and used by him to get what he wants. I mean, yeah, she did drain Bane of all the venom he has, which is pretty sadistic, but it's also Bane, he's a villain, so it's not that surprising. But how do you just infect a cancer-ridden five-year-old with Titan? Like, what the fuck? The level of sociopathy is insane. I, I can't imagine injecting Titan into a child, let alone one that's dying, and having any bit of morals or human emotions when doing so. The story makes Dr. Young almost as fucked up as the Joker, to be honest. I, I don't care if she was tricked into doing this. If you were a decent human being, you'd probably draw the line of injecting a child with the same drug that causes Bane and these abominations. So yeah, now whenever I replay Asylum, I will constantly have in my mind the fact that this chick injected Titan into a dying child. You evil fuck. Overall, like I said, I think this is the best Arkham episode out of the six. It's a really fun playthrough, actually feels like a proper DLC, Harley actually gets to have a proper boss fight, and it plays into the pre-Asylum setting by going back to that dark nature of the game. On probably any clip of Asylum, you'll find people talking about how that game's a lot more darker than any of the other ones in the franchise, because of the fact that the franchise didn't have its style yet until City. And with the inclusion of this story of the park builder and fucking Starro, it returns back to that darker vibe, which is really nice. Also, in general, getting to play as Barbara is cool. There is one thing that I feel like I have to mention. You could call it a nitpick. I don't even really think it's that much of a complaint, but the grapnel boost is not a thing at all in this DLC, and every single time I'm reminded about that, I just think about how it's an Origins. <laughs> Like, year two, Batman has the grapnel boost, but then by the time he has Batgirl and three Robins, they don't get the grapnel boost. And then when he goes back to Asylum, he doesn't have the grapnel boost. And then it's not ready for field deployment when he goes to City, but still uses it. Again, I honestly don't care, but it's just kind of funny. Especially given how this DLC was made by Warner Brothers Montreal. It's like they heard the complaints about the grapnel boost in Origins and just didn't put it in the DLC. <laughs> Oh boy, yeah. 
GCPD lockdown follows Nightwing going after the Penguin. After beating up a bunch of Penguin's goons in Bloodhaven and finding out that they're heading to Gotham to go break Oswald out of the GCPD, you head there to go stop it. You beat up a few more goons, jam the elevator that Penguin's in, and spend the rest of the DLC in a Predator mission inside three stories of this building. After taking out all the goons, you rewire some junction boxes to, I think, give Lucius access to the building's power. Then you go up to the rooftop and fight off the reinforcement goons before meeting up with the Penguin and taking him back to the GCPD. That's the entire DLC. So again, we're going back to the combat combat predator combat formula that the other Arkham episodes follow with nothing much else to be had. I mean, yeah, I have fun playing as Nightwing and hearing his quips, or this moment between him and Lucius that, combined with it being wholesome and the way that Scott Porter lets out the laugh ended up being really funny to me. So, I've been thinking. You, uh, pretty much own everything now, huh? I hope you're not going to ask me for a loan, Mr. Grayson. But I bet you've been throwing some mad parties, right? Off the chain, I believe they say. <laughs> It did get old hearing it after every single time I died and had to restart, though. But, yeah, I'll be real, there's not much I can say about this. It's fun playing as Nightwing, and I spent a lot of the time in the Predator mission and then dying constantly on the rooftop, and that's about it. It's one of the DLC of all time. Catwoman's revenge is exactly that, Catwoman enacting revenge against the Riddler for keeping her hostage throughout the events of the main game. Her revenge is pretty much what you would think Catwoman would do, and that is drain his entire bank account while he's in jail. You start the DLC replaying the vault section of Arkham City, getting the three key cards that you need before it's a Predator mission. After taking everyone out and solving a puzzle to get into the main vault, it's a long combat map with Riddler robots and a giant laser. After taking enough of them out, you get into Riddler's bank account, drain his money, and the DLC is over. I'm not even kidding you, that is all there is to this. It's just so... nothing. The best part about it is Riddler being stupid and more great Delisle Catwoman, but that's about it. There's nothing really else to say, nor is there really anything here. The Catwoman sections in City were way better, and hell, even the sections in Night are better than this. The DLC honestly just kind of struggles to have a purpose in existing, and I honestly wouldn't really recommend it. I give it like a two and a half. Out of what? I don't know. And finally, the last Arkham episode we have is a flip of a coin, the Tim Drake DLC where I'm kind of upset that they recast Troy Baker, because I would have loved to say that this DLC was Troy Baker going after Troy Baker. <laughs> Anyways, the DLC follows Tim hunting down Two-Face and being incredibly salty about it, because it's during him and Barb's honeymoon and he'd rather be on a beach. Honestly, valid. Once again, it follows the structure of Predator, Predator, Combat, Combat, and with no Two-Face boss fight. Have you noticed that? In the three Arkham episodes that WB Montreal made, there's a boss fight at the very end, and in the three that Rocksteady made, there's no boss fight. You get to the end, and it's either a cutscene, guy's not even there, or quick time event. At this point, I'm just getting so tired with Rocksteady. Anyways, I don't think this is bad. It's fun playing as Tim again, and his gameplay is pretty much the same as in Harley's Revenge. There's a section where you have to explode a brute and then fear multi-take down two goons while the room's mostly covered with sentry guns, which is kind of neat, interesting, something. It's something. And there's some cute moments between Tim and Barb. Who needs a tropical island when... You've got a waste disposal facility to infiltrate. I'm cracking up here. Sorry. It's different now. You're on your own. What, leaving me already? That's not what I... Don't worry, Barb. I got this. I've managed to hack the PA system. Oh, maybe we can squawk him into submission. Fine, Mr. Grateful. You get to listen to Harvey for a little bit longer. It's gonna take some time to hack. I'll race ya. You let me win on the door, didn't you? I... Listen, people with guns, definitely your thing. But other than that, it's just play as Tim Drake for a bit. That seems to be the case with five out of the six Arkham episodes. Just play as a character for a little bit and that's it. Now do you see why I think Matter of Family is the best? I at least had shit to talk about. Inland! Now that we have all the Arkham episodes out of the way, it's time to talk about the Season of Infamy, which is a pretty hefty DLC, adding four new side missions into the main game, having them be unlocked the further you progress in the story. You got Wonderland, which is about Mad Hatter, Beneath the Surface, which is about Killer Croc, In From the Cold, which is about Mr. Freeze, and Shadow War, which is all about the League of Shadows and Rachel Ghoul. So starting off with Wonderland, you head to an interrogation room in the GCPD where Mad Hatter's being held to interrogate him for the information on where the three cops are being held hostage at. Turns out they've been put in the trunk of cop cars spread throughout Gotham that are also filmed to the brim with explosives that'll go off when opening the trunk. 
So you glide through Gotham, hearing out for a siren that'll point you directly to a car, and then play this little game of moving the joysticks to connect a line with a circle that I completely blocked out of my memory, and I think was easier when I first played through the DLC, but for this playthrough, I kept blowing up cops on accident. <laughs> I am good, Batman. After freeing the three hostages, you head back to the Mad Hatter, where he traps you in a book where you proceed to endlessly beat up goons, save mind-controlled cops, and avoid getting crushed by turning pages, all while a giant Mad Hatter watches you the entire time. After you're done with the three stages, you end up back in the interrogation room and lock up Mad Hatter. So while I'm not a big fan of the cop car portion, mostly because of the bomb disarming, I do really like the book combat map. It feels a lot more Mad Hatter than a clock in a void, and just in general more aesthetically pleasing, especially with each chapter representing the Rocksteady's Arkham Trilogy. Am I a little salty that Origins gets no respect or acknowledgement at all, especially when the Mad Hatter fight in the game is still the best in the franchise? Yes. But am I surprised? No. The fact that I can't even make a Bethesda comparison because I actually acknowledge New Vegas' existence at one point. <laughs> I also like the transition from the book back to the interrogation room with the ticking clock getting progressively louder and more aggressive before its final tick ringing out. And also, while the whole mask mind controlling isn't a new thing in this franchise by any means, it feels more focused in here, what with it being put onto the hostages and having to get the mask off of them. And that just makes me think of the animated series portrayal of Hatter, and anything that reminds me of the animated series is a plus in my book. Overall, I think this is a massive improvement from Arkham City's Hatter encounter, but my least favorite out of the season of Infamy missions, mostly because I'm not a big fan of the first half, and not much really happens. Shadow War starts off with you font color AAEBFE unlock requirements font complete font color AAEBFE 27% font of the City of Fear Most Wanted mission, which roughly translates to go to the rooftop of a building to see two dead League of Assassins members, setting up a crime scene and following a blood trail that leads you to an abandoned memorial building where you're met with League of Assassin members to beat up. After being shoved into the bat tank for the billionth time just to start up the generator and giving the building power, you explore deeper and deeper until eventually finding an underground room holding a dying Raish al Ghul and his loyal members. Turns out some of the members of the League have rebelled against Raish and also found the last sample of the Lazarus Pit and the loyal assassins want you to go get it. This gives Batman and the player an ultimatum. Either get the last bit of the Lazarus Pit and save Raish or let him die. When you get to that last source, you're ambushed by the Rebel League. After taking them out, grabbing a sample, and about to explore the source is when the Rebel's leader shows up, who turns out to be Talia's sister, Nisa, who explodes the source herself and asks you to go destroy the machine that her zombie of a father is living off of. Returning to Raish is when you finally have to pick a side, and the game gives you the second ever multiple choice, so of course, I love that already. But on top of that, it brings the question of whether or not it's morally right for Batman to not cure Raish. On one hand, he has his no-kill rule. On the other hand, Raish is a dead man walking, and having him finally die once and for all will stop the war between the Leagues and Gotham. Honestly, I think this is where Arkham Knight's writing is at its peak. And it's during a fucking DLC. <laughs> so what choice did I make? I decided to let Raish die. Which may be a bit hypocritical of me, given how I'm so against Batman killing, but this is one of the great things about the DLC, is that it opens up conversation for people to be able to explain why they chose the option they did. In my case, I think Nyssa has a point about Raish having already died a thousand times, and my personal answer to Alfred's question... Is preventing some ungodly resurrection truly the same as taking a life? ...is no. It really isn't. Again, Raish has already been dead. He even offed himself in Arkham City, and the only reason why he's still here is because the League dragged his dead body away and put it into the Lazarus Pit. It's not like Batman's murdering him with his bare hands or putting one in the temple. He's just pretty much refusing to give him his fix. And I guess destroy the one thing keeping him barely alive, which is a little iffy, but I'm gonna just choose not to think about that. Also, Ra's has this line where he asks Batman to save him for Talia, which is... Kind of scummy, manipulative behavior, because Talia's dead and Batman's still grieving, blaming himself for it. And also, Raish literally put a sword to her throat. He doesn't give a fuck about her. So that line kind of doesn't sit well with me, further making me not want to revive him. And my final reasoning is... I just think this is hot, so I'm aside with her. <laughs> <laughs> And besides, after blowing up the machine, Nyssa almost kills Raish herself before Batman stops her to take him to the GCPD to let him pretty much die slowly in there, which is... Okay, maybe this choice is a lot more sadistic than I thought. And when you take him back to the GCPD, it mimics the ending of City, 
which made me think maybe this is a bad ending. So I went and watched what happens if you give him the cure. And turns out he ends up just killing Nissa and escaping. So honestly, I think just letting a dead man die is a much better outcome. Overall, pretty good DLC. I enjoy seeing the League again, the ultimatum of letting Rache live or not, and then offering the question of does this go against the no kill rule is pretty good Batman writing in my opinion. And again, Nisa. She's just mostly the reason why I like this DLC. <laughs> And I like the two Easter eggs of finding the woman from the diner and no body where Talia should be. Beneath the surface is Batman and Nightwing investigating Iron Heights, a prison airship that just crashed into Gotham. Turns out the reason why it crashed was because of Killer Croc. Why the hell you have Killer Croc in a fucking airship to begin with, I have no idea. But the consequences of their actions plays in because it's now in the water and Croc loose in the ship. And probably many dead people. Exploring deeper into the ship has you saving some guards, but not the warden, because Croc gets a hold of him and, uh... Well, that's definitely a different look. After Nightwing appears in thin air and you get to play with the dual combat system, you gotta go find two of the guards that managed to escape in order to get their key cards and go further into the ship. After doing that and going deeper into the ship, you end up in a room that explains the new Killer Croc design. Turns out the Warden is a sick, vindictive fuck that kidnapped Croc and experimented on him and cut off his limbs in an attempt to weaponize Croc's healing power. And in response to all that, his body mutated from the trauma. Croc wants payback. Can't say I blame him. And here's where I drop an unpopular opinion. I kind of like this croc design. I might just be talking with Jonas too much because this almost MonsterVerse Godzilla-like design on top of the backstory behind it just works for me. It plays into the sympathetic nature of the character that some comics also play into, and I just like that. Is it the best croc design? No, not really. But seeing this bloated, even more monstrous version of him as a response to being forcefully experimented on makes me feel so bad for him. And like I said, it reminds me of Monster vs. Godzilla, which reminds me of Giant Croc in Mechs vs. Mutants and my Godzilla joke. <laughs> Anyways, you have a boss fight with Croc that involves dual combat with Nightwing, so again, love it. And then you take both him and the Warden to GCPD, putting Croc right next to the Ward, making him scared shitless constantly, which is amazing and well-deserved. And even Cash ends up feeling bad for Croc. Bastard ate my hand at the asylum, but I still feel sorry for him. Though then again, my hands don't grow back. Honestly, I think Beneath the Surface is a pretty good mission with the design of the ship and the sympathetic story of Croc. And also, it's more dual combat system and getting to be around Nightwing, so that's automatically a dub. In From the Cold is without a doubt Arkham Knight's best DLC, not even just in the season of Infamy, but out of all of them. Now, if you're familiar with In From the Cold, you would think this is kind of a weird opinion for me to have, given how there's an entire two-wave tank battle. But you know what? I can forgive that. But before we get to that, should explain what the quest is about. Well, obviously, it's about Mr. Freeze. Apparently, the Arkham Knight's militia asked Mr. Freeze for his help in the main story, but he refused because, duh, all he cares about is Nora. So they took Nora. <laughs> I love this moment between Batman and Freeze where he can't bring himself to actually kill Batman. They took Nora because of you. Then they returned her in exchange for Batman. If you trust them, Victor, take your shot. Warning, cryogenerator unstable. It's probably obvious by now, but any story where Freeze only cares about Nora and will do anything he can to get to her is enough for me to like it because I'm so fucking sick of him being written as just a generic villain. So anyways, you go to get Nora just to find out that the militia moved her, so you get the info from the nearby guard before giving him a $7,800 hospital bill. Again, loving moments like this where Victor's impatient and just wants to get his wife back, and Batman keeps having to try to get him to focus on fixing the equipment. Heading to the new area that Nora's held captive at for some reason gave me Joker dialogue from the main story. This is the only time he ever shows up throughout Season of Infamy, and it's not even related. <laughs> I don't have many thoughts on Joker not being in here, but I will save them for the overall portion of this DLC. After wiping out the militia in a Predator mission, you're finally able to save Nora, where it's revealed that she was actually somewhat aware during her cryogenic stasis, that she knew she was being kept in there for a lifetime and could hear Victor talking to her. She finally gets to talk to him, and of course, Victor's only focused on saving her. It's been his hyperfixation for 23 years, but Nora eventually breaks and says she doesn't want any more saving. Before more can be explained, the signal cuts out and there's an explosion off in the distance. Now the militia is on their way to take out Freeze, and it's time to hop into the Bat Tank and battle. 
The tank battle is like any other tank battle, but at least it ends with Victor telling Nori he loves her before wiping the area to Kingdom Come, which is wholesome enough for me to be fine with this. And then the story ends with this really bittersweet ending between Nor and Freeze that's made me tear up multiple times. I can't save you. Maybe there's another way. Victor, this isn't you. I won't let you destroy yourself anymore. I wish I could have told you sooner. I don't want you to die, Nora. Then let me live. I won't have much time. Days. Time never has been on our side, Victor. And that's In From The Cold. Why do I think it's the best out of all the DLC? Well, because it's Mr. Freeze, damn it. For real though, it's a great story. It's not the first time Mr. Freeze has had an ending with his wife, and it's not his happiest, but goddamn if it ain't wholesome as fuck seeing the two of them finally get to spend time with each other, even if it's only for a few days. Maybe it's because I've been playing through Phantom Liberty, but it reminds me of my favorite ending in Cyberpunk 2077, where despite knowing that V only has six months left to live, she gets to spend those last six months with the older coldos, Pan Am and Judy, with her new family. Breeze and Nora, despite only having a few days left to be together, get to spend those days together. And Nora's time has never been on her side, she just tugs at my heart. It's so wholesome and such a bittersweet end for them. I love it. And that's it for the Season of Infamy. Overall, a really good DLC. Even with its lowest moments, it's just got so much content, playtime, and genuine good stories and writing moments that it not only makes it the best DLC from Arkham Knight, but maybe even the best DLC in the entire franchise. I mean, look at what it's competing against. A bunch of mid. And even compared to the good, I honestly would still have to say it's better just for how much there is, and the four stories give it a unique variety. I mean, yeah, Cold Cold Heart is great, but at no point does it make me tear up like the ending of In From The Cold does. I think genuinely my only complaint of the DLC as a whole, and it's more just disappointment, is that Joker doesn't show up. Now, I know that sounds like the most stereotypical Batman fan, and there's definitely many of you out there that heard me say that and winced into oblivion because you're so sick of the Joker, and I completely get you. Where I'm coming from is that the Joker is in the main game already, being in the back of Bruce's mind and popping up to make comments that add a lot of entertainment to the game for me personally. And when I first went through this DLC, it was well after finishing the game and not hallucinating the Joker anymore. So I decided to hold on finishing the story until after I finished Season of Infamy, thinking maybe there's a chance Joker could show up to make some comments throughout the stories, or even just at the very end when locking up the villains, or Victor and Nora are off to spend the rest of Nora's life together. But none of that happened, and honestly, I do get it. It could just be the case of Rocksteady genuinely not wanting to put the Joker in, maybe because it's a DLC and most players at the point of the release would have finished the main story by then, but I honestly just took it as they couldn't get Mark Hamill to come back for a DLC, and that makes sense to me. While I would have loved to hear Joker's comments on Hatter, Raish, the whole drama between the leagues, Croc, or Victor and Nora getting a bittersweet ending, I mean, think of how many times he mentions killing Talia in the main story. I feel like he would have fit really well in Shadow War. I can hear him making some comment about Croc's new look, or finding some fucked up humor in Freeze finally getting to be with his wife only for her to die in like three days. In the end, I get it. And it really doesn't impact how I feel about any of these stories or the DLC as a whole. Just another moment of Alex's imagination going wild and then disappointment when it's not reality. Anyway, Season of Infamy is a great DLC and I would highly recommend it. There is actually one more DLC for Arkham Knight that I can't play because it's a PlayStation exclusive called Scarecrow Nightmare. Hmm, Scarecrow? Nightmare? I wonder if it's anything like the Asylum- Oh for fuck's sake! Arkham VR was released on October 11th, 2016 as a PlayStation VR exclusive before being released on other systems on April 25th, 2017, and is... interesting, to say the least. Just like with Origins Blackgate, this is my first time I've ever played Arkham VR because I don't own any VR gear. Luckily, I have a friend who does. 
And to tell you, my history with VR was a uh, decent amount of blade and sorcery and like half an hour of gorilla tag. So that's my experience going into this. <laughs> the game starts off in quite possibly the worst fucking way possible by showing you the Wayne's death. I'm so tired of complaining about the Wayne's death every goddamn time we see it, but this is just fucking absurd. I mean, what can I even say? It's POV, you become an orphan. Why, why would I want this? Why, why would anybody want this? <sighs> Anyways, after getting that pointless shit out of the way, the story officially starts with Alfred telling Bruce Wayne that he has some news for him, but it would be more appropriate to be told somewhere else. So it's off to the Batcave where we get to suit up, and this is so great, I'm loving this a lot. Thanks to the VR aspect, picking up my gadgets and putting them onto my belt, grabbing batterings and throwing them, and even putting on the cowl myself, truly makes me feel like I'm Batman more than any of the other games combat or flying ever could. Heading further down, we enter into the Batcave, where we can grapple the different sections, forensics, surveillance, the back garage, case files, and the back computer. Here at the forensics, I get lost for half an hour because I wasn't paying attention to what Alfred said, being too distracted with being Batman, and I had absolutely no clue what to do. I managed to dissect all the blood, as well as just naturally take my own blood and dissect it, because does stabbing myself with this needle I found do anything? <laughs> At one point, my friend was going through a walkthrough and telling me what he was seeing, which was to grapple to surveillance, but I didn't have the option to grapple. I genuinely thought my game might have been broken. Turns out you just had to click on Alfred first. Time for- ah! You're then able to grapple to different places after he tells you that he hasn't heard a response from both Nightwing and Robin, so it's time to go figure out what happened. Heading to Nightwing's last location, I was brought into black vaporwave void with the joysticks before nothing but a black void and then magnificently spawned in an alleyway. Maybe I just don't understand VR gear from not having one of my own, but a visual for the loading time would have been cool. Origins did that for the Batwing. Anyways, remember when I said that the previous VR games I played were Blades and Sorcery and Gorilla Tag? Well, in those games, you can move around. In this one, you can't. In order to move, you look in the general direction of an area that the game may have whitelisted and press the button on the joystick to teleport there. Imagine, for a second, this alleyway mission right from the very beginning where you're on the fire escape, but with the Gorilla Tag physics so you can grab and leap over the bar. Which that decision to make it so you have to teleport to certain places in order to move was confusing to me given how I was playing this game on an Oculus Quest 2, a VR set that has joysticks on the controller. And turns out, I didn't know this until I was writing the script, uh, the PSVR that the game was originally built on has these for controllers. You know what? At least Sony learned their lesson. Anyways, we find out that Dick is dead. No more Dick. R.I.P. Dick. Dick got his neck stab. Dick's head was twisted. <laughs> Fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> Reading that out loud was far worse than writing <laughs> And hey look, Rocksteady even kinda put Origins crime scene gameplay in here. That's pretty cool. Unfortunately, unlike in Origins and even Night, where you can speed up the fast forwarding and rewinding, you can't do that here. Just go forwards and backwards at regular speed, which makes it kind of torturous when I watch the scene in its entirety and then have to rewind back to the beginning to pick out clues, get to the ending and I'm missing something and have to go searching for it all at regular speed. There's also this part where a second identity comes into play and you have to figure out who it is, and I spend so long not thinking of teleporting. The witness turns out to be associated with the penguin, so it's off to the iceberg lounge after a bit of brooding. Showing up to Oswald, you can listen in on a conversation between him and two of his goons before throwing a battering at a tank, filling the screen with smoke and the sounds of beating up the poor before Penguin is hanging upside down. Right as Oswald mentions that the witness is in the morgue, you're held at gunpoint by three of his goons. Instead of being able to do anything, throw any gadgets, disappear, anything, you awkwardly stand there and look at each individual goon in order to get the Batwing to take him out. Very fun. For whatever reason, Rocksteady wasn't able to get Nolan North for the game, and instead we have Ian Redford delivering the lines, and he's... Well, in comparison to Nolan's performance, not good. 
he sounds like your typical angry British man, which I guess is fine, but it's a very noticeable difference between performances and... I don't know, it just becomes almost distracting how much of a downgrade it is. Anyways, you go to the morgue in order to inspect the bodies of not only the witness, but the victims of the iceberg lounge explosion that also took the witness out, and search for fragments of said bomb's detonator. When it comes to getting to the third body, you have to get the key to the cooler from the safe, which meant I spent a stupid amount of time struggling to find the code before the game pointed out to me explicitly to use the forensic scanner. This is a recurring theme in this gameplay. After finding enough fragments, you're able to build a simulated copy of the detonator and find out that it was owned by a demolition company that's currently destroying an older sewer system. Batman figures that this could be the hideout of the villain and also searches for Robin's transmitter. Showing up to the sewer, you're greeted with the wonderful sound of the Joker. So obviously, the main story, after taking forever to figure out how to restore the power, getting jump scared by Croc, and setting Robin free for only a few moments before he's murdered right in front of Bruce's eyes, you're teleported to Arkham Asylum where you get to hear that wonderful jingle again before getting to look into three different cells. The first one shows you Scarface, the second one's got Zazz, but unfortunately he just stands there with his back turned to you saying nothing, and finally, the third one... Turning around, you realize that you're in a cell for yourself, and the game becomes incredibly trippy from here, with things changing every time you look around, the walls slowly growing, writing and tally marks, visions of the game's previous events haunt you. Eventually, you look down to see blood on your hands and look up to see that you're the one responsible for Nightwing's death. The walls at this point are covered in the signature Joker highs, and with one last look at the mirror, you have fully become the Joker, who has the last laugh, and then, credits. So I finally found you. you oh, fuck you off! Me. So yeah, if you didn't already know or couldn't tell already, the game's story is a nightmare sequence built off of the infected Joker blood. Which is... Look, I get what they were trying to do. Take the greatest detective aspect of Batman and use that as the baseline for a story, giving us a different look at a Batman story in the Batman game. And that's fine, I like when stories focus on the detective part of the character, but I don't think this was a good story. First of all, I don't think I'm the first to tell you that the it was all but a dream reveal is a played out cliche. But secondly, uh, I don't know, it, it just feels like there's nothing really here. It's just kind of go to places to do a bit of detective work, watch Robin and Nightwing die, and then you're the Joker, and then, ooh, it's a dream. It's just so short with not much happening. The only reason why it took me so long to get through it is because I'm dumb and kept not understanding how to do shit or forgetting gameplay mechanics. I mean, for fuck's sake, Batman Arkham videos completed the whole story in an hour. And yeah, they're a god who managed to beat the Penguin boss fight from Black A in eight minutes, but an hour worth of story where you just go to places, stand still, look at stuff, move on, repeat until Joker Twist game ends, just makes it feel so lackluster and nothing. The concept of Arkham in VR sounds amazing, and there are moments in this game where that VR aspect lends itself to truly making you feel like Batman more than the original games ever could, but it's also just so half-baked. You're only given three gadgets, there's no combat, the movement's clunky, and the story is just... eh? It's so short, and the end result of Bruce becoming Joker and it all being a nightmare makes it so lackluster that there's absolutely zero replay factor to it. It's a game with a lot of potential, if it was actually made with passion and care, which I don't think was in Rocksteady. I mean, come on, the last game they made killed off Batman and started with This is how the Batman died. And the next game they spent four to eight years focusing on is a whole Suicide Squad game called Kill the Justice League, which includes Batman. I have a feeling they're tired of Batman. <laughs> well, I guess apparently you saved the Justice League. I don't know, I guess kill sounded better. Sounds like false marketing to me. <laughs> I don't know if I would call this game a cash grab, but I would say that it feels very much like a demo. Like Rocksteady was told, hey, make an Arkham VR game, and they just quickly threw together something. Or maybe this is something that Rocksteady genuinely wanted to make, that they saw the VR technology and it inspired them enough to make another Arkham game using it. But if that was the case, why the hell is this so undercooked? It straight up is just a demo showing off what could be capable, which is so disappointing. 
Thankfully, I got the game on sale and only had to pay $5 for it, but I would fucking never pay the full 20 bucks that they want for this. Okay, maybe it is a cash grab. As a VR game, I obviously don't have much to compare it to, and I also have to consider that it came out originally as an exclusive, and only a few years after, slash kind of in the same time that VR made a big impact in the mainstream. But with that being said, I don't think it's aged well. Coming into this after being decently familiar with the controls of Blade and Sorcery or Gorilla Tag, it really shows its age with how little movement you have. And not to mention it being a PSVR exclusive to begin with with those god-awful controllers. With that being said, I do like the feeling of the utility belt, being able to get the closest you can to physically picking up a battering and throwing it. That's pretty fucking cool. And the act of putting on the bat suit is really cool. I, I was geeking the fuck out the entire time. As an Arkham game... It's not worth it. Unless you already have VR gear or, like me, know someone who will let you use it and you can get the game for $5, I wouldn't recommend it. Not even just the original price, but going out and buying VR gear just to play this glorified tech demo is a thousand percent not worth it. Because not only is it an hour long if you're not stupid like me, but like I said, the story is so lackluster and is a fucking dream sequence that it's just pointless. I'd say play it if you ever get the chance, but don't go out of your way to try to. It's one of the games of all time. Watching my favorite movie. What was the name of that movie again? Oh yes, Attack of the Stupid Bungling Idiots, who can't find an even bigger idiot running around dressed like a bat! Now it's time to rank the franchise. Bottom of the list at number six is Blackgate. This thing had an interesting concept, but just became so rage-inducing and annoying. I genuinely can't recall a time where I actually had a fun time. It was either neutral boredom or rage. Do not recommend it at all, in the slightest, and I will never touch this game again. Number five, I'm honestly gonna say Night. It's just a frustrating experience with absolutely no replay value for me, especially after this video. The only time I think I'll ever touch this game again is for gameplay in the Pattinson suit if one, I can even use that suit, and two, ever actually finish my review of that movie. I have no intention or care to come back to this even with parts of the story that I like because it's such a slow startup and then a disastrous ending for me. I completely get why people are into this game, what with the best combat system in the franchise, the city of Gotham, and if you actually like the Bat Tank, and that's completely fine. It's even Kevin Conroy's favorite of the franchise, and I 1000% get it given his reason. Everyone looks at things from their own perspective. So I look at it from an actor's perspective and my performance, and Arkham Knight, the way it resolved was a real acting challenge for me. And I was really proud of how Mark and I worked with each other and how sick that ending was. For an actor, from, from my perspective, um, Arkham Knight is my favorite. I was really proud of that performance. You know what? At least we share the same opinion on the best Batman movie of all time. But personally, I just have so many problems with the game and the story that I just don't like it, and I don't want to play it again. And number four, this might be a surprising one, and most definitely going to be a controversial one, but it's VR. I know I said that I don't recommend the game unless it's on sale and that there's no replay value, but there's actually one very specific reason that I would ever replay this, and that's if I ever end up getting my own VR gear some years in the future and decide I want to replay through it because I already own it. And that's more reasonings for me to replay play it than Arkham Knight. <laughs> and I know me putting VR above Knight is gonna make people think I'm saying that VR is objectively a better game than Knight, and for the one millionth fucking time, I grade on enjoyment and I enjoyed VR a little more. For one, it doesn't have the annoying bastardization of Jason Todd. And I don't know, I think replaying the story when I get my own VR gear is a better reasoning than playing some combat maps in a Pattinson skin. And number three, another undoubtedly controversial spot, I'm putting Arkham Asylum. Like I said, I don't have much nostalgia for the game because I only got to play through it once before my disc scratched and I had to wait damn near a decade before I could play it again. So despite it being my introduction on a more serious take on Batman and these iconic roles for these iconic characters, I don't have much memories or personal connection with the game. Now don't get me wrong, I do like it, it's a good game, but it's just kind of sad as the first game for me. 
A great first game, but still the first game. I don't have much history with it. Plus, a lot of the boss fights are kind of shit, and I, I just do not like Titan Joker. But at the very least, I have no problem replaying this. I don't often think about doing that, but I don't dread going anywhere near it like I do at night. At number two, I think this is where the list gets the most controversial, and what makes the placement at number three probably my most unpopular opinion in this entire franchise. I'm putting Origins. I think the game is heavily overhated. It is a great story from beginning to end, and it's just a lot of fun. Unlike with Asylum, I have so many memories of playing through Origins so much. The whole beginning of the game will take me back to 2020 with my first year endless and the Batman trailer breakdown. The ending of the game will give me flashbacks to winter of 2018 when I first finished the story, thinking I had a ton of it left because my save file said I was only at like 30%. Or New Year's of 2020 when I was going through the game again and played through the final Bane boss fight with Brayden. Fun fact, my copy of the game that I still use to this day was bought off of him for $20 back in 2014. That may not sound like a big deal, but the thing is, he told me that's how much GameStop would give him. That is not how much GameStop would give him. So, like, I have a personal connection to Origins, and I think it might even be the game I've played the most in the franchise, and I just think it's really fun. I like it. A lot. And finally, at number one, no shit, I give it to Arkham City. I would be smoking some heavy-ass crack if I did not put this game at number one best in the franchise. First of all, Arkham City has Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill. As much as I like Roger Craig Smith and Troy Baker, they're not Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill. Also, Grey Delisle is in this. But on top of that, it's got one of the best deaths of the Joker. I think it's got a great story. Some would disagree, but I don't give a fuck about Protocol 10. So that being in the background because Batman's trying not to fucking die all thanks to the Joker, fine by me. It's got the Mr. Freeze boss fight, best boss fight in the entire franchise, second to Electrocutioner, of course. <laughs> and just in general, like with Origins, fun as hell. And at least I could finish the Riddler trophies in this one and get a satisfying ending. Both City and Origins are on my list of favorite games of all time for different reasons. Origins, hell of a lot of fun. City, fucking amazing. Also, I think I would say that City's opening is better than Origins. Origins fucks, don't get me wrong, but City's is just bone chilling at times. And there's something about it that just sits so iconically in my mind. I think that's how I would describe it and why I would still put City at the top of the list. Origins is fun, City is iconic, and it would be such a disrespectful disservice if I did not put it at number one. And with that is the end of the video. I know this is the overall section, but I honestly don't know what to say about the overall of this franchise. It's iconic. It's got three solid games in it with Night being weak to say the least, but I wouldn't necessarily say it's a bad game that brings down the franchise as a whole. I just have a lot of problems with it, and the only thing I think I would say is bad about it is just some of the writing. And probably the tank fights, both just in gameplay because they're boring, and in writing because it makes no fucking sense for the man who knows how Batman thinks to send unmanned drones. The only things in this franchise that is actually genuinely fucking awful are one-offs that are so far apart from the mainline games that it's so easy to ignore, and to some people, they probably don't even know they exist to begin with. In general, when talking about the franchise, the vast majority of people are going to focus on Asylum City, Origins, and Night. And in my personal opinion, when it comes to the games I like, it's 3 for 4, which is pretty fucking good. Yeah, I love this franchise and these games for a good reason. And the fact that two of them are some of my favorite games of all time is kind of crazy, because you'd expect only like one from a franchise to be on the list. And like I've said multiple times throughout this video, I genuinely think this franchise is responsible for me becoming as big as a Batman fan as I am. And that's probably the biggest props I can give to it. Anyways, I don't know how to end videos, let alone long-ass ones like this, so uh, subscribe if you'd like to, I guess. We're close to 1k. It would be absolutely fucking insane if the channel ever reached that number, because that's been a dream of mine for no joke 10 years. <laughs> And, uh, tell me what your thoughts are on the Arkham franchise in these games, because not only are comments great for engagement, but it's nice to get the occasional sane comment and to see if your opinion is wrong. But I also like interacting with strangers about their opinions on things I like, as long as they're not disrespectful cunts about it. Anyways, I'm just dragging this on longer than it needs to. See ya! And of course, everyone has their own opinion, but my opinion is the best opinion. I'm sure you figured that out already.
subscribe and please